Hi, I'm Greg Zegan, and I'm a developer at Zendesk. My name is Alan Hogan. I'm also a developer here at Zendesk, and we both enjoy working on the front end and, and building UI. Greg is a bit of an accomplished Elm developer, and <laughs> myself not so much. I'm very new to the language. I've read through the guide, and I built a very small project for myself, but I, I could definitely learn a lot more. And Greg's been hard at work on something called GOAT, which stands for Graphic Ornamentation and Annotation Tool, basically an image editor for screenshots. And we thought it might be fun for me to kind of click through all the code in GOAT and try and figure out what's going on with Greg here to guide me through it. So without further ado, let's get into it. Yeah, let's do it. Maybe before we jump into the code, we'll just do a quick demo of the, the app, actually. So you can see you can um, make and edit annotations, including arrows. And uh, here you have like a custom drawing tool, and you can go ahead and pick a color, doodle around. Or you can select existing annotations like this one and change the color, like the line thickness, that kind of thing. Uh, there's a custom uh, pixelation tool, so you can blur out information or faces or whatever it is. Uh, this tool is mostly designed for working with screenshots, so in most cases you're going to be blotting out personal details and stuff. Um, you know, the text is editable, so you can you know bump the, the font size and and change the, the text. Oh, looks like I'm having trouble selecting it, but oh, there we go, that works. Uh, but uh, we should note that Goat just went through a major refactor. Mm -hmm. So um, there might be some, some bugs today that we'll see, and you'll just have to forgive us because it's still a work in progress. All right, so that's the gist of what Goat does. Now looking here at the main file, um, I see a lot of imports. And it looks like these things are all just internal parts of Goat that Greg built, um, including flags, which I'm not really sure what flags are. Model, which I, I think everyone who's gotten a basic look at Elm um, should understand. Subscriptions, which are slightly more advanced, but that's a way to watch outside information and get updated about it. And then goat.update, which is, of course, also a very core part of the Elm architecture, along with view. HTML, which is the standard uh, goat rendering, sorry, Elm rendering uh, library. library. Yeah. And then Rocket, which is something I don't know. Greg, do you think we should take a look at Rocket already, or should we wait until later? I think we should, at least from a high level, address anything that you have a problem with. Not a problem, but a misunderstanding of what's, or not enough knowledge of what's on this page. Like you said, okay. flags and Rocket, you didn't know what they were. Right, okay, so what, what are flags? So flags are, if you see the second argument, um, I wouldn't even call them arguments. So this is a main function, mm -hmm. is a program. And you see a bunch of types after it, right? You see yeah. flags, you see model, and you see message. So, uh, and you can see down in HTML dot, we see HTML dot program with flags. Okay. The flags are just static configuration. So when you boot your Elm app, maybe you want to give some information on boot, like uh, what operating system uh, you're on. Um, or uh, maybe there's like an initial set of images you want to load on the page. So it's just a way of passing in some uh, values from JavaScript uh, to your Elm app to start. Um, and that's all flags are. And so you can have a program uh, without flags, you just say html.program, and then instead of seeing program flags there, you'd see program never, meaning this is a program that doesn't ever take any arguments. Okay. So that's the distinction. Okay, so it's just information provided to your program at, at launch or initialization. Correct. All right, cool. And then Rocket, Rocket seems like a third party library, is that right? Mm -hmm. It's from No Red Ink. Uh, I was at a meetup where Richard was describing to me a nicer way to uh, send out um, commands. Uh, commands, if anyone's unfamiliar, are just a way of describing that the runtime should do some side effects for you. Um, or so, like, get a go make an HTTP request or um, go f focus an element. Mm -hmm. And so, Rock is just a, you'll see it in use in the update code a lot as a way of just um, shortcutting that uh, the making the tuple of returning a model and command. So it's just a shortcut uh, okay. library. It sounds like we don't need to spend too much time on Rocket right now then. No, but it is okay. useful. Cool. Well, I guess one thing I'm curious with is I wonder what kind of flags you're actually using then. So I'm going to go ahead and, and look in your source folder here mm -hmm. at the flags file. Um, 
Okay, so module go dot flags exploding. Sorry, exposing. Exploding. Yeah, exploding. <laughs> that's when you, you show something and it blows up. I guess, <laughs> which might happen today if we uncover a particularly bad bug. We'll explode goat. Mm -hmm. um, flags and an image, um, which we can see to find down here. So flags it looks like a type, um, a union type, that tries to tell you both if something is, um, if you're on a Mac or not, and whether you're in Zendesk or not. And I'll just let uh, our viewers know, um, the reason that we're, we're gonna be curious whether we're on Zendesk or not, is because Goat is embedded into an editor app inside of the Zendesk support product. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll be able to download and use Goat in your Zendesk help desk. That's the support product. Um, right in line as you're composing a reply to someone. Mm -hmm. And okay. one thing to note, by the way, you, you called flags a union type, and in this case, when you see type, space, then the names, like if it was type flags, that would be a union type. Okay. This uh, is an alias saying, we're going to call the record that has is Mac Boolean and in Zendesk Boolean, we're going to call that record, we're going to oh name my. it flags. Oh yeah, I did say union, but I meant record, of course, okay. right? Yeah. So yeah, this is a record, mm -hmm. right, because, um, right. Because the we're not saying that flags can be as Mac or as in Zendesk. Zendesk, no, it has to be. Um, it's like a JSON object in that it has Correct. these as properties of it, right? Of mm -hmm. course. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. Sure. So here we have uh, type alias image, which is also a record and not a union. It looks like the an image would be the image that we're annotating, and it includes an ID, a URL, apparently a source for that image. Correct. Uh, width and height, and then original width and height. So I, I'm assuming this is because our editor won't always show our image at the native resolution. It's actually because um, we allow, in the Zendesk context, we allow images to be resized. Mm -hmm. and so they, they, they have an original height and width in which we edit in that context, so it's full res, and then we'd like to export it um, as the width and height that they now resized it before using. So okay. it's really not a thing that is associated with GOAT, as it is associated ah. with an, a certain app context or oh, platform. Okay, so we're not resizing the image, we're just um, writing an image tag back to the rich text editor in Zendesk at a certain dimension size? Correct. I see. Cool, good to know. Well, this is very simple um, to see that we only really care from our environment whether something's, um, um, whether we're on a Mac and whether we're in the Zendesk app context, mm -hmm. um, but also that we'll need to start with well, this is just a type, so I guess we don't really know where the images are coming from. I guess I'm curious to see how these are actually passed into us. And I'm going back to main here. So I can see that the init file, hmm, actually no, I'm, I'm talking faster than I'm thinking. I'm cu what I'm curious is how those goat flags are actually used when we start our program. I'd like to see that in action. So I guess I don't, I don't, I see, um, we're using something called rocket.batch in it. Mm -hmm. And, but I, but you can still see that we're still using in it, which is something that we imported from go.model. Mm -hmm. So to see how those flags are used, I think it makes sense for us to go look at the model. Sound good? Yes. Okay. All right, so here's our model, and uh, interestingly enough, you can see another type relating to Zendesk again. But again, I'm very interested in finding out where these flags are used. Sure. Do you want to just scroll to where you think, where yeah, you can find them? Yeah, I'm going to look for init somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, oh, here we go. So here we have an init function. Um, and as a relative Elm newbie, it's often confusing to read type annotations, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a stab at it and Greg might have to correct me here. Sure. Um, so init looks like it takes an argument flags and it returns a tuple. Correct. Uh, containing our model and a list of commands. Mm -hmm. And that sounds about right to me, just from what I know of Elm so far, um, because you're init function is always going to have to return a state, essentially, the model. Yeah, the first state. The first state, as well as um, in a program that has commands, 
commands <laughs> yeah. to be run like, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else to note here with the type annotation? So, no, that's, that's everything. And I was going to say that the only difference between that program with flags and just normal program is that you'll, uh, in program with flags, you have to pass an init function that takes an argument flags. Ah, that and then that's the only difference. And then also, if you go back to main, uh, Alan? Um, yeah, let me see if I can bring that up. Um, when you were asking about batch init right there, yeah. and batch up, it's been related to batch update. All those are doing is those functions that I wrote are returning a list of commands, and batch just means let's put them together. It just runs command.batch on them. Oh, okay. All it's doing. Oh, seems straightforward. Okay. So, wow, this is interesting. I'm looking at this code, and before I even get into it, this code highlighting has uh, made this pink part jump out at me here. <laughs> And this RGB color looks familiar to me because I recognize it from the Go editor as I'm just going to go ahead and refresh this and start editing an image as the default uh, stroke color you can see here. So that kind of makes sense that that would be there in our init function. If you go ahead and draw a shape, you'll see it, it comes out with that color. So I think that's interesting to note. Uh, I guess it makes me feel a little confident already just because. I'm seeing something and it makes sense. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's great. So again, I'm looking at the init function and we looked at the type annotation. Now we're just taking a look at the function itself. It takes two arguments. These are our flags as we declared above. Mm -hmm. And these flags we remember from flags.elm. Mm -hmm. You also but, noted just before, if you go back, you said that mm -hmm. it takes two uh, arguments. Where I'm wrong, right? Because it's actually one record. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. are just destructuring. Right, yeah. okay, so we're just structuring it there in the method signature, or I guess we don't function methods, signature. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Yeah, sorry, uh, everyone listening, please note this is a functional language, not an, op uh, an object-oriented language. <laughs> yeah. It's very important <laughs> <laughs> in the Elm world, is my understanding. Okay, so, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing at myself because, of course, it's very important. Um, like I said, I'm somewhat familiar with Elm, but... I'm not as into it yet to the level where I have like the special underpants and everything. Like I, you oh, know, yeah. I'm not yeah. an, an elder. Yeah, uh, I already have like four pairs of underwear. So. <laughs> the, yeah, yeah, the special elm underwear that every keep, quarter keep away operating or sorry, uh, I meant to say object oriented languages. Yeah, yeah, from haunting you at night. Okay, so um, wow, <laughs> I might have to edit that out. <laughs> That's fine, man. Um, all right. So init, again, takes one argument that's a record and includes those two flags. And then trying to read this method signature. Or actually, this is no, that's the end of the method signature. Actually. Yeah. Sorry, I'm saying method again. Sorry, function signature. Um, but then we immediately start with just a massive record. Mm -hmm. That's the model, and that makes sense because that's our initial because that's the model, and our model is large because it has to be large to do everything we want to do. Yeah, um, and so we're just returning a model here. Um, I'm trying to think of where our list of commands go, and it looks like um, is this relating to that Zendesk Rocket library you mentioned? I'm uh, sorry, no writing rocket. Yeah, no writing rocket. Uh -huh. So yeah, that's so that little rocket is just the same thing as the tuple operator. Mm -hmm. So a tuple, um, the when you make a tuple and you see it up there in the signature, you'll see how there's a right. parenthesis and then something in that comma, right? And it could right. be like four commas in there. Right? It could be a four tuple, five tuple. Um, but that uh, arrow is actually the same thing as that comma. And so it's just uh, okay. it's just making it's just taking that first big state right. and then putting it into a tuple with whatever is right. after the arrow. Right. Goes in between them. Right. Yeah, this is starting to come back to me. I think I learned that a couple of months ago and then I didn't use it. Right. Because I was thinking, well, why are we just returning a um, a record already? Sorry. Yeah, a record slash our state already. If we also have to return a list of commands, and the answer is we are. It's just like. There's kind of an invisible parenthesis here to start the tuple, thanks, yeah. to, thanks to this, you know, creating that in the mm -hmm. end. Okay. And that could be a good or bad idea. Um, if it was more readable as a tuple, then maybe it's more readable as a tuple. So. Yeah. Well, you know, again, as a noob, I'll leave that judgment to other people. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, 
big initial state model right there, then um, our commands that we're starting with are very simple. It looks like if we're in Zendesk, then do nothing, which is interesting. Otherwise, we'll listen for an image upload. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting. Uh, so to give a, users a bit of context of why we're not listening for image uploads uh, in Zendesk, and we are on the web, um, because in the web, it might be useful to you know, drag and drop an image onto the page. Well, in Zendesk, if you tried to drag and drop an image into this app, um, there's actually another image grabber inside Zendesk that would take your image. So um, since I can't reliably get, you, get it from drag and drop, in Zendesk, I don't listen for any image uploads. Okay, makes sense. Uh, um, well, I guess I'll just go through here, and I don't know if we should take too hard of a look. Do right you want to start now. with the types instead of the actual values? Because you're just seeing a lot of values. Yeah, right now. I don't know. Let's go ahead and take a quick scan of the values, and if they don't make sense, that's fine. You can go look at the model. Sure. But um, it's interesting, I think, already to start to get a, a sense of this. Um, like, it looks like the model has a concept of edits that is how the undo feature is powered. Mm -hmm. And of course, it makes sense to start with an empty array of edits because we haven't done any yet. Um, this edit state, which I'm sure is a very complicated part of this app, is initialized to the initial state. Okay. Uh, the clipboard has nothing. Um, drawing equals draw line arrow. Interesting. Shape. This doesn't make sense to me that we'd have these yet, but actually thinking of it now, um, no, I don't really understand that unless... Hmm. So we have drop dots, right? Yeah. But I don't think... I don't see a drop down that has both draw line and arrow. Are lines supported right now? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, lines are supported. They're just behind the shape uh, drop down. Oh, right. Um, so it's not that when you were reading that where it said draw line arrow, that wasn't mm -hmm. saying that it was doing both. It was saying that um, for a line drawing, it's of the arrow type. Oh, okay. So, yeah, if we read the types, we'll, we'll learn more about that. Right, okay. I guess we'll come back to that later. Drawing, drawing, type arrow. Okay. Well, uh, we'll come back to that. Waiting for drop down toggle equals nothing. That makes sense that we wouldn't be waiting for any particular thing on the knit. Fill, so the default shape fill is empty. And, and that makes sense because uh, that's represented here. This means empty fill. It makes sense because um, in this annotation editor, most of the annotations we'll make probably won't have a fill because they're there to emphasize something um, by being drawn around them, not by blocking them out. Um, but we can if we really want to, you know, if you really want to protect the goat's privacy and, and you feel like the pixelate function is not strong enough, you still might rec recognize that farmyard friend. So, um, cool. All right. So default fill is nothing. Default stroke color we've looked at already. D stroke style, default stroke, okay. Uh, font size 20, more defaults here. Uh, current drop down is nothing. Okay, so this looks to me like Greg's uh, thought about the fact that he never wants to have more than one drop down open at a time. So it looks like his state's making that impossible. I know it's a big pattern in, in the Elm world is to try and um, make uh, undesirable states impossible. So if I tried to open more than one drop down at a time, that's not going to work. But um, Anyway, uh, good to see that here. Okay, so animation, sorry, annotation menu is nothing. What's an annotation menu? Uh, do you want to show off the feature of send it back and bring it front? Oh, right. Um, sure. So if we have a line here and just I'm going to change its color to yellow just to make it a stronger contrast with the other shape, um, um, I guess I can, I can right click it and then uh, send it to back. So that's kind of interesting. Um, in terms of uh, how the different shapes interact. And you can see that even though we sent these shapes to back, they're still in front of the um, pixelate because it's very special because it's operating pretty much on the image itself instead of being an annotation layer on top of it, um, at least at a conceptual level. Conceptually, but actually it is in the, so you could send that to back and then you won't mm -hmm. accidentally click it as much. 
So, um, oh, really? but that might be a feature that we have to make it so that it's always in the back. Yeah. That's something to consider. So that's a design. If I just design. bring it to front, it doesn't actually change anything. Yeah. Um, do the way that we're actually rendering this. Mm -hmm. But there is a rectangle over there, so that's why you're able to click it. Um, Interesting. Over other things. So well, yeah, that's so maybe if something I send it to the back right now and then I click here, I'll, I'll click yeah, on that. Yeah, you click on that, but if you send it to the front, you probably click on the blur. Yeah, fascinating. So. Okay. How about that? Well, uh, going back here, annotation menu, nothing. I guess it's just not open at that point. Mm -hmm. um, showing any menu if it's false. Uh, more it sounds like more support for logic of uh, you know making sure you only have one menu open at a time probably. Um, images is a list dot zipper dot from list applied to an empty array. Fair enough. By the way, that's the empty list, not an empty array. Just so you know. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That would make sense given that the function is not called from array. Mm -hmm. uh, image selected false. Press keys empty list. Correct. Look at me learning. Mm -hmm. Operating system, and then we use the value of the flag that will be received to assume either Mac or Windows. Not that we're ignorant of other operating systems existing, but because uh, we're going to have Windows style keyboard shortcuts for everywhere except Mac. Mm -hmm. And then we know we're only going to build this for Zendesk or generic web. For now. For now, yeah. Maybe it'll be on Electron someday. Who knows? Cool. So, so far, so good. Um, um, I felt like we just looked at the whole model that Elm, but that's because we scrolled to the very end mm -hmm. <laughs> to get started. Yeah, do we want to start from the top? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, so, we're importing a whole lot of things here. Maybe we can skip those for now. I think conceptually sure. they're not that important at this moment. So again, we have uh, a type definition, and this one is actually a union, not a record. Um, so you can either be on platform Zendesk or web, um, which, you know, again, being not super into Elm at this point, you know, something that I think at this, at this moment is, you know, it's kind of nice that we have this defined as a type with two options. Um, if I were trying to use Rather, if I were trying to set a platform value, I might be tempted to put Windows or Mac there because that's another way of thinking of the word platform. Mm -hmm. But if I do that, it'll tell me, no, it has to be Zendesk or Web. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and maybe platform. I have once I used, I did call it context before, but mm -hmm. I know context is just a name that you give things when you can't name something. So uh, <laughs> so I'm still working on a best name yeah. for that. Um, I don't right. use it in that many places. But. And of course, I think it's I think it's a fine name. My point isn't that it's an ambiguous name, it's that the type system will catch a misunderstanding nice and early for me. So totally. something that I'm learning to appreciate in, in Elm and type languages in general. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, type alias start position equals position. Okay, interesting. Um, I don't have too many thoughts on that at the moment. Just uh, like when we're when we're starting a drawing and ending a drawing, it might be mm -hmm. nice when we define those annotations for functions to say like, oh, this argument is the start and this one's the end, so we don't mix them up. Okay. Um, when, when we're reading, you'll see that more in the actual code. Cool. I'll keep my eyes open for that as we go forward. Sure. Uh, we have uh, another union type we're looking at now. The attribute dot attribute. Mm -mm -mm. Got to have someone do a run through who can actually speak. Okay. Attribute. Uh huh. Yep. Attribute drop down. I'm sorry, folks. Looks like it can be shapes drop down, spots, spotlights drop down, fonts, fills, stroke colors, or strokes. Wow, that's a lot of drop downs, but we have a lot of options here in the editor. Um, you can see here that um, one thing we haven't talked about too much actually is the spotlight feature. So this is kind of neat. You can draw a shape, and then everything around it gets this kind of gray overlay creating a spotlight effect on the the um, the area inside of the shape. And it's kind of nice, too, that you can actually draw multiple spotlight shapes, whether they interlap or not, sorry, overlap or not, and um, it'll just kind of work. So that's pretty nice. It's a nice feature of GOAT, and that's what we were referring to with the spotlight. Okay, so 
this is just the union type representing the different kinds of drop downs that we can have here, as we just saw. There are quite a few um, drop down menus in the app, although some of them work differently than others. Okay. Type vertices, rectangular or linear. Fair enough. This seems this makes intuitive sense to me with the fact that you because I'm already fairly familiar with how some of these annotations are, are created under the hood, but uh, basically with something like an arrow, um, an arrow or a line, you have a starting and an end point, um, which is not entirely dissimilar to, but distinct from how uh, other shapes work, which is that they're considered to have like a top left and a bottom right mm -hmm. um, corner, even if they're an ellipse. So that's interesting. Um, and I guess, you know, I was going to say, you know, it's not obvious maybe at first why that distinction is important, but with the fact that in both cases you you have two points, but then thinking about it for a second, you can see there is one big difference when I select these. The, uh, the rectangular ones have four control points, whereas the, um, what do we call them, linear ones have two control points. So right. I'm guessing that's the whole reason you have that difference. Yeah, I was waiting for you to discover it, and you discovered it, discovered it so you're good. Nice. Nice arrows, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can thank Alan. <laughs> so here we have a, a union type on resize direction. So we've got uh, northwest, southeast, northeast, southwest, and move. And that's more support for resizing here. You can see we've got the move direction cursor. Hopefully you can see that in the screen recording. And then here you can see we've got the um, diagonal uh, cursor. So it feels very, um, you, you might even notice when you're using the app because you're just kind of expecting cursors to work like that. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to control all that, which is crazy. Yeah, you do, you do. And I know at one point during the development, like we had we had it like wrong where it was like, they all had the, the yeah the same direction the same direction and it just felt very you'll wrong. notice that if you go between different like if you um draw it to the left like take that uh, mm -hmm. reversing go all the way to the left you'll see that flip oh direction. wow look at that yeah so even up to down yeah so. wow it goes a little crazier in the middle as, yeah as you would expect mm -hmm. cool um then we have type drawing did you used to call these annotations uh, we are still calling everything annotations. Um, this drawing, I should probably... Have ah. put, I'm going to put a comment here, um, but I'm just going to verbalize it right now. Yeah, I think these, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. These drawings are just saying, uh, what drawings are they in the controls are on the left? That's it. Oh, okay. They are not actually... It's like, I have selected the control to draw a freehand drawing, and then therefore I'm going to start um, drawing, and that creates a certain type of annotation. There's a, there's a linkage between these drawings and the annotations, but mm -hmm. it's more of just like what shows up on the buttons. Interesting. So this has to do with the buttons more than the controlling else. UI, yeah. Okay. I, I guess we'll see these guys get in the way. You will. Got a, another union type. Uh, annotation menu. I think you meant to say type alias. Ah, I did it again. <laughs> uh, a, a record. Yeah. I said union. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I started to be proud of myself. I'm like, I didn't mess that one up, but I totally did. That's okay. Nice. Record. I do know the difference. I, I, I don't know why I keep getting those mixed up. Okay. So the type alias of a union. I guess I'll stop to ask a brief question here. Why is it that when we define a union type, we don't call it an alias, but when we create a record type, we do? Mm. Because the alias uh, keyword is saying, um, we're just referring to whatever structure is behind that equals as something else. So like if we didn't have type alias annotation menu right there, um, and we threw those types in, we could, we'd have to copy and paste that um, the index and position record with mm -hmm. all those type information everywhere. But when we say type alias annotation menu, now we can just reuse that shortcut like name. It's just an alias, mm. like a bash alias. Or, but, okay. Or but but the type mm -hmm. without the alias is saying that this is something where we can expose just type drawing. And you could, for instance, not know any of the things underneath it, like draw shape, draw text box. So you can, you can use that you can type to say, um, this is uh, type drawing. You don't know the internals. Or you could expose certain constructors. That's why I would call each of those mm -hmm. ORs. So that's it's just um, it's a language choice to say type and type alias. I think 
and Haskell, they have different names entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but they are two different things. Interesting. So if I just put tight annotation menu equals and then this record, it would be your compiler? Yes. I guess I'll leave it at that then. Um, and then here's our, our big model type that we saw in use earlier in init. So type alias, again, it's a union record. record. <laughs> I don't know why I keep doing that. I guess I think it's, I'm thinking of it as all these things coming together to make a bigger thing. And I guess that the word union makes sense for me there. But, um, but I'm well aware that union is mathematical concept. Just the ors, right? Yeah. Those, those vertical bars. So that's how I distinguish it. Is when I see a bunch of the bars, I'm like, oh, those are all ors. We're just yeah. saying this or this or this, make that. Right. And of course, it's, I just know it's fundamentally different. I mean, one thing you're saying, it can be this or that or the app. And then a record says, we need all of these. Correct. Um, like a struct and C or something. Yeah, this is, you call them structs if you need to. Yeah. It's whatever, no. whatever helps them distinguish I'll, for you. I'll, by the end of the video, gosh darn it, I'll have it <laughs> down. Sure. Record. A record. So we've got a massive record here um, because it's the one model that represents our whole application state. Yeah, that's everything. Which is everything. So. Pretty cool if it's on the one screen, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like not even with the tiny fonts or anything. And with comments. And with, uh, with comments, yeah. How about that? All right. So again, we've looked at these in use before. I don't want to spend too much time on these. Understanding the types, I think, is a very good place to start, though, with, uh, with Helm programs. So, like, I grouped these into comment um, comment sections because I felt that it was useful <laughs> for when you look at it, you know, for first time, like, what's Fair what are these different things related to? All right, to? Greg put in all this work so that we can understand it, <laughs> so we might as well give it a shot. All right, so annotation editing state includes the edits, the edit state, and the clipboard. Interesting. And I understand why you have a maybe here, I think, but what, what are we using the clipboard for? Copy and paste and cut and paste. Oh, right. So sometimes we have an annotation that we're ready to paste. Sometimes we don't. Okay. Makes sense. And of course, um, where did we see it? We saw the init function down here. Mm -hmm. The clipboard state defaults to nothing, which makes sense because the user couldn't possibly have copied an annotation within Go yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. And then edit state is the edit state type, which we probably saw already, right? Well, it's no. actually imported after ah. my very large refactor the other night. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Making the edit state is a finite state machine. Um, How about that? Uh, maybe we should go actually look at the little diagram that I drew up um, for the finite state machine. Yeah, that would that? be inside. That. That's I in your code? I don't. I think I took it out of the code um, okay. and put it into a wiki on the repo. Oh, so well, let's see if we I can did go forget to. Find that. Is that uh, here? It might be there. Yeah, let's try that. Yes. Uh, cool. Go, oh, to, the go wiki. to the wiki. Yeah. Or sorry, right here. Wiki. Um, annotation editor's finite state machine. Wow. Okay. Oh man, it's not a horizontally. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. Can we? Uh, Make it bigger or no? Yeah. It's it's kind of catching everything. We can we can do a little bit of horizontal scroll. I don't know if there's anything we can do. Um, mm. Maybe if you edit it raw? Let's try that. Oh, yeah. Hey. There you go. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll drag this go. bigger. Is that the max? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, you can't win oh, it man. all, huh? Uh, can't have it all, can we? <laughs> all right. Well, that's, okay. it's fine. We only need to look at bits at a time. Sure. All right. Wow, okay, so let's dig into it then. Uh, where's our initial state, Greg? Uh, it is at ready to draw. Okay, ready to draw. So here we are at ready to draw, and it looks like we can go to either of two other states next. We can go to either drawing annotation or selected annotation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so putting that into practice, that well, Do we want to restart the thing so there's uh, so many things on it? Sure, Greg. Okay. So here's our cute goat, by the way. And you, just for the record, you should always click the cute goat. Okay. <laughs> so it uh, works better. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? It does. Okay. So I have t two options generally. I can either draw something or select it. So it's interesting that 
you like the first thing I have to do can't really be selected annotation, even though I can go from ready to draw to here. Mm -hmm. The very I can't actually start off by selecting something because nothing exists. Yeah, but that's okay. Um, um, I guess we would say that, like when we have nothing selected right now, we're probably in that ready to draw state, right, Greg? Yes, we are. Because we have nothing selected, we have we're not drawing anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I can go click this or start drawing. Yeah. And so I actually did, I wish I updated this diagram, but I did rename ready to draw to not selected because of this same thing. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. So there we go. So let's let's imagine that we're drawing an annotation. And then I guess when we finish, we very well might end up back at ready to draw. Um, let's give that a try. So drawing a shape. Nothing selected. Like we're back at ready to draw. Mm -hmm. Um, but we could also end up at editing a text box as our next state. Want to try that out? Yeah, let's give it a shot. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and show off the undo yet, which I don't think we've done at this point until mm -hmm. now. Cool. Um, that was interesting. I think maybe you had if some you, cancels in there? Yeah, if you had Interesting. Hidden, we should, we should there. investigate that. Yeah. Probably right. with the free draw. Yeah, which is a relatively new feature. Mm -hmm. So here's the text, and clearly we're in an editing text state. I'm just going ahead and, sorry for the noise, folks, type a little bit and then um, click out of it. And there we go. We have some text on here. Uh, so editing a text box, it seems you, you're forced to, to follow the next um, transition, which is to ready to draw. Yeah, it does not go into a selection state afterwards. Makes sense. And... So pretty much whenever you draw something, you end up back at ready to draw. You just might have to go through editing a text box first to get there. Correct. So that means that um, we've done, we finished exploring the whole state machine. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> fin <halfway. laughs> finished exploring everything that can happen after you go to this state, though. So back to ready to draw, our only other option is selected annotation. And it looks like what you can do from there is indeed go to editing a text box again. On a double click, yes. Okay. I should put some labels on these arrows <laughs> eventually, but yeah. Or we could go to moving annotation or sizing annotation, and it looks like both moving and resizing annotation dump you back into selected annotation. Um, now, one thing I, oh, I do see here, I missed the one one of the ways this arrow goes, which is to back to ready to draw. And so that's, of course, just deselecting everything. Mm -hmm. Cool. Is that it, then? That's, that's the entire, the entire state station. Yeah. Only six states, mm -hmm. and I don't want to count transitions, but it's probably a little more than six. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Getting to that gives you a better frame of mind around how yeah. all the behavior is. Cool. Yeah, that's really interesting. And if we go back to our code here, um, we didn't actually look at it in code yet, did we? But um, let's bring that up. So here's uh, goat edit state elm, and well, I guess I'm not sure what I expected here, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of code. Yeah, uh, <laughs> let's scroll up a bit. Um, yeah, and let's scroll down a little bit further than some of these types. Okay, um, just down to edit state, the actual finite state. Ah, machine. here we go. So I this did rename those from that diagram um, to I think a little bit better. Ready names. to draw is now not selecting. Yes, and then no. everything else is just shortened from like selected annotation to just selecting. Everything is ing. Um, I felt that that was nicer. Editing, mm -hmm. resizing, moving. Um, and then they all are just union. It's a union type, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Totally. You want to take it from there? Oh, okay. Well, this is interesting. Multi-line comment, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not really what we're here to talk about, but I haven't seen many of those yet. Okay. Um, well, I guess. I guess it might be instructive to take a look at how we get from one state to another. Um, so, hmm. well, I don't know, Greg, what do you think we should take a look at then? Well, okay, let's, um, do you mind if I do a little bit of explaining just to start yeah. and then you can ask questions, um, sure. and stop me. 
This is like the most complicated part of the app, I would say. Uh, so might as well dive in head first, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> so let's. What I do in this, uh, I create an API for um, for the state machine. I never expose these internals. Um, I used to, and after a very large refactor, they're now hidden because um, nice. I don't believe that these should be exposed to the user. Um, a bunch of forced functions, right? Like start drawing will change the state. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty much all it does. So I don't entirely know if every function I've written right now uh, enforces the same state machine that you all saw in that drawing. Um, like we can see in start drawing, I just straight up return the drawing state. Um, so hmm. that means I haven't checked to see if it was coming from. Yeah, so it looks thing. like you're not guarding against um, transitions that you don't want to allow. Sometimes I am. Um, like in the case of start moving, I check to first to see if are you selecting and then I cha change it to moving. Um, so the only reason that you're gonna see some not doing it and some doing it is because uh, I haven't had a problem yet and I haven't added the guards for everything. <laughs> um, the only times that you do see these guards, as I'll call them, I guess, mm -hmm. um, is because I need the information from the last state. So in, in this one, I think it's a great um, function to demonstrate. All right, let's take a look at the start moving function then. Sure. So we'll start by looking at the annotation, which I think is probably how a lot of Elm programmers Start to understand a function? Correct. Okay. Start moving takes a position argument and an edit state argument and returns an edit state again. Interesting. So start moving again takes a start position. Well, I said again, but this told us it's a position. This told us it's a starting position. Yeah, I might want to make that. Uh, annotation say start position like we saw before. right yeah we saw that earlier yeah that can be useful for documentation yeah do you think we could change it right now would things work no let's not type on the keyboard it's pretty loud yeah fair so. enough okay so we'll just uh we'll just leave that for another time then uh, start moving start an edit state and then um look i'm guessing well we know this we just looked at it edit state is a union uh type because that's uh when you'll usually see these case in Elm is to deal with a union. It's actually only for union types. There you go. I think that's, oh wait, mm, that's not true. You can use them for lists and stuff. Never mind. Oh. Whoopsies, but uh, I can explain <laughs> that at a time. <laughs> okay. Uh, watch out, they might take away those special underpants. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I might just lost a pair of my Elm <laughs> underwear trophies. So, yeah. yeah. But go ahead. Uh, so, this is interesting, but if I read this slowly enough, it looks like selecting is a function that we're calling, right? We are calling it. We're not defining it. We're calling a function. We are taking the result of the function, right? The edit state, the union type, correct? So we're, we're, we're matching on all the possible cases that the edit state could be. Uh, so we're matching on selecting. Hmm. Does that make sense? Let's Let's take a look. Selecting. Okay, so so that's right. Selecting is one of the possible. Mm -hmm. edit you might want to look at selecting info um, to see what it is. Oh. If you command click, it'll actually bring command you to the definition. Click. Okay. There you go. Con <laughs> selecting info is a record. Finally did it. <laughs> uh, with an ID, an integer ID, and annotation attributes as attributes. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes some sense. I I think we need to know what is selected, which I'm assuming would be the ID. Correct. Annotation attributes, I wonder what those are. I'm going to command click it and see what happens. Um, another record, this time where we've got stroke color, fill, stroke style, and font size. Oh, and I just remembered why this exists in that state, or rather... I remembered something that explains to me why it would be here. Mm -hmm. Mind if I go ahead and show sure. off the feature? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and, well, get to my um, uh, default state, um, not, not, not selecting, I think we call it now. And I'm going to change the color and draw, yeah, why not, a round rect here. Um, and now maybe I'll, I'll draw a different colored round rect on these cute little hoopsies. Okay, so here we go. 
And then watch what happens to this, uh, this button when I select this annotation. You see it changed. So now it's this light bluish cyan color. Um, and so it's reflecting the current value. Um, and I bet we could even get that to work with the thickness too. So if you see the, the line thickness, it's changing based on the current selected item. So that's kind of neat. And then when we deselect, it goes back to the last value that we explicitly chose. Yeah. And, and that wouldn't be possible if we didn't have this annotation attributes um, involved in the state. So that's pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. So we followed a bit of a chain to get here. I'm a little lost now. Okay, we'll go back to edit state. Thanks, Greg. So selecting info is that union of our of which um, which annotation to do select and what are the attributes that that we want to reflect in the UI. Wow. Okay. I guess at this point I would like to see us get in. Maybe maybe this is a big jump, but I just want to see the magic happen. I want to see us go ahead and and use this selecting info. I want to see us get into that state where we're, we're selecting. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means something has to happen on click. Yeah, but so you want to go to the view code, huh? Yeah, can we jump over the view code? Sure, um, I know it's a big jump, but yeah, I'd like to see that happen. Okay, so uh, yeah, we have a view. So view a view module or folder, um, how I've currently structured the code is it gets grouped um, by like, logical associations, like a lot of things that are in the same area. Um, maybe drawings are all on the left in the control area. Um, maybe all the annotations are in the draw space. I think I call it drawing area. Um, but what would be really useful, I don't know, is if we went to just the view.elm file. So it's actually just below the update here. Uh, mm -hmm. So in here, I actually have a comment um, explaining the structure of wow. the view for okay. the app. So I think this cool. would be useful to, yeah. for you to read and give me feedback on. Totally, all right. So, uh, as we saw earlier, we support two different platforms. There's the, the naked web version of Goat, which we're looking at here today, and the um, Zendesk Editor context to our platform. Mm -hmm. um, so we might want to just look at web today. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, because we have special processing for importing images from the Zendesk context, but we're going to skip that since we're not going to demo that. So on the web, uh, we need to either wait for an image to be uploaded or we need to select um, the default goat images <laughs> that are provided, including the famous cute goat. Um, that's uh, Greg's official name for it, by the way. It is. Um, um, upload brings you to, to the image annotator. Okay. So if you were to drag and drop your own image yeah. to that first screen, you'll go straight to the annotator. Right, right. Obviously, you wouldn't want to pick a goat after you just added your own image. Mm -hmm. And then we have, I was trying to talk about something called image annotator, which is controls and drawing area. Okay. So this makes sense beca yeah. because um, this, is, this is, I kind of think of goat as just that, but it's true that. That's not true. There's there's the screen here, um, so that's what the comment is trying to tell me is that um, that once I get past this stage and I'm actually editing, then we have this control panel and then the annotation area. I believe is what it was called. Sorry, drawing area, mm -hmm. which shows our image and then lets us overlay it with our our drawing. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should call it annotation area, considering drawing for me is being a different being used in a different way. So. I see. Well. Yeah, well, whatever makes the most sense. I think, yeah, I'm able to follow it. I can see why you're saying that because uh, typically we've been referring to annotation to refer to these objects that we created and drawing is what you're referring to the buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, okay. Um, drawing area, though, um, it says... Well, we have little pipe symbols here. Yeah, which maybe I should explain that. That's usually... actually just me to um, say, I, I'm kind of using it in two ways right now, which is kind of confusing. In the image annotator thing, I was just uh, pointing out that if you look at that, it's on the left, it's on the left. that, and then this is on the right. Correct, unless you're right to left. But, but this is not meaning left. No, this right. is saying uh, the order in, it's an array. Um, the actual like SVG um, has a, a bunch of children. An SVG tag has to have a flat list of children uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm just showing that the order from left to right from the beginning of the right to the end is all the SVG definitions 
um, like okay. the pixelate filter and that mask that we've seen. Right. And then it's followed by, there's a pixelated image underneath the image that we cut away with uh, when, we, when we use that tool. Um, and then there's just this straight up image and then all the annotations come after that. So this wow. is just a high level visualization and maybe I can do a better diagram uh, showing that. Okay, but yeah, so wow, so so we just, um, we didn't really talk about this, I don't think, previously, but yeah, how this editor is powered is pretty much just straight up SVG, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe we can take a quick look actually with the inspector just to, to get a, an introduction. Oops, that's like Looks like I need to on. stop that from happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we were going to look at the SVG here and... Um, we're just looking at what exactly we're rendering here from the Go app. Um, so here's the whole annotation app. That's like the Elm root. Um, modal mask, class hidden. Well, don't mind if I do. Hmm, nothing happened, okay. <laughs> uh, controls, so we have all the buttons over here. Um, it makes sense to just some dooms and some buttons in there. Um, okay, well, let's back up out of the controls for a minute. Okay, so so here's our, our oh, interesting canvas. It's only 20 pixels. Ah. Yeah, I don't know if that's well, what I care about. Right. It looks like the SVG is inside it, even, so it's just extending outside of the bands. That's okay. Mm. Whoops. Right. Well, good to know. But, you know, not a big deal. All right, let's take a look at the SVG itself. So um, we got defs here. And the defs include our pixelate mask effect, um, which is, oh, that's not the effect, actually. That's actually um, a mask. Well, here's a filter, though, another filter. Um, Do you want to draw a pixelate to see how that changes? Yeah, let's try that. So here's, here's the pixelate, and um, you can see the... It's highlighting some changes here, I guess. So here's our pointer cursor rect. But this this rect is very big. Mm -hmm. Why is that? So you see how that says fill white, and this mm -hmm. one is fill black. So mm -hmm. the reason um, that that um, the way the filter works is sorry the mask works is that we are cutting holes. Mm -hmm. Well, and by cutting holes, what we're actually doing is we have a white backdrop by mm -hmm. drawing that big rectangle mm -hmm. and then we just put black fill above it mm -hmm. and then when we um, in the actual annotations that are not in the defs we just say that their filter is that mask and so that's how it gets the pixelate effect mm -hmm. so it looks for those um, those uh, what I call them as cutouts cool all right then um, oh so if we oops if we go ahead and add another pixelate rectangle now we've got two black masks in the rectangle, or black rectangles in the mask, rather. Okay, interesting. And then here's our actual image that we're annotating, I guess. Um, makes sense. Well, let's go back to the code. So how, or rather, these are, I guess, what we just looked at in the SVG, isn't it? Okay. Correct. All right, so going back. It says how views are split up, views folder, right, is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> controls, functions for the drawing controls, so we just saw those, those are all the buttons. Drawing area, functions that build up a drawing area with its submodules, uh, so it's a, a folder itself. Drawing area, and right here, includes annotation for functions for rendering an individual annotation. Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, definitions, functions for rendering the SVG defs, of which there look to be quite a few, actually, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everything in here, including our mask. Um, masks, plural, actually. Uh, vertices, functions for rendering annotations vertices on selection, um, which I believe I helped actually edit some of that code at one point. You did. I? We just moved it around. Yeah, yeah. it's been refactored since then. Uh, icons, uh, functions to render SVG icons for controls, image selection, etc. Uh, an image selector, the 
functions to render the image selection gallery, aka cute goat and other goat. <laughs> other goat, what a nice term. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. We're, <laughs> this is recorded after all. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, no goat's ugly, okay? Yeah. Uh, utils, utility functions for view specific transformations. View specific transformations, well, that's kind of vague. I'm going to go take a look just to see what's in here. Oh, I, see, I think I see what's going on. Hmm. So position to string takes uh, a record as input with X and Y components, I'll call them. Um, what would you call them? Fields. Fields, them right. Fields, yeah. And it returns a string, and it does that just by concatenating the string value of the X field with a comma and the string value of the Y field. Seems... Um, straightforward enough to me. Yeah. Uh, and is this used like so you can draw in the SVG or what do you use this function for? Uh, generally the arrow code um, is still a little messy as it's a raw string like it's just a big uh, SVG path string hmm. um, and so what I just wanted a little helper function to um, make those into nice coordinate like coordinate pairs with a comma. Hmm. Um, but I'd also say that all the util modules are, in, in my mind, rather like bad practice or just when you're starting something up as you don't really know where to put the functions yet because you haven't clearly defined what is going to be modular, like what things you're going to break out. You don't have a clear definition in your head. Hmm. So actually, this used to be huge. I see. But now it's rather small, and I probably just want to go and put um, like that direction to cursor over like where the resize direction is defined rather than importing it and mm -hmm. exposing the internals. So. Right, because you're probably not using this in that many places, are you? Exactly. I see. Like it's literally maybe even one. Probably even one place, yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense then. So we were looking at um, view.elm. All right, so we've kind of run down how it's broken up. Mm-hmm. Well, as we should know by now, um, the view function needs to take a model and return uh, HTML of message, I guess. Yeah. I, mean, HT uh, I think the best way I've heard this explained is HTML is definitely not HTML that we were inspecting the element before. It's a data structure. Right. And uh, the message is saying what kind of... Um, what, what kind of data can it produce when it's interacted? So if you click on it, if you mouse over it, if you do any of those things, mm -hmm. so this come back as Boolean, so like mm -hmm. everything's a Boolean, is everything a um, integer, mm -hmm. or is everything a union type? And we're just calling that union type message. Okay. So all the possible interactions that come in as a union type. Mm -hmm. And not to get too in the weeds here, but my understanding is this right that we're putting that here because those messages are things that we ourselves are going to tell Elm to give us. Like we're telling the HTML abstraction that Elm provides us that we're going to expect to get back some messages from it. Yeah, all the values that are possible to create a message. If you command click on that, by the way, mm -hmm. you can see the actual definition too. Of the messages? Yeah. Um, doesn't want to work for me. Maybe it's because you're in Vim mode. <laughs> oh. Hmm. That's oh, command clicking. Yeah, because now, now try one more time, just because my editor sometimes duplicates. I don't know. Hmm, doesn't want to do it. Sorry. Okay. Well, if you go to update, it'll be in there if you want to. Um, okay, let's take a look at update real quick. All um, oh, right, so here's our um, union type, actually, this time, not a record, um, of uh, message. Wow, there are quite a few in here. It's out of all the state I mean, updates. More than a few. <laughs> look at that. Wow, okay. So I guess we're, what in, a, in effect, what we're trying to say here is um, that our view will have the power to do all these things or rather give us these messages back mm -hmm. in the Elm architecture. Correct. So when, when the user does something in the view, we're, we're going to get a message to start drawing at a certain position. And, and so on. I mean, I could, I could spend quite a long time reading these. <laughs> Maybe we should even, but um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, like, I guess when you're drawing, there's just three different, there are only three different messages that you can get. Start drawing, continue drawing, and finish drawing. Um, and maybe an obvious question is, why not just start and finish? 
In fact, I think that's how the earliest version of Go worked, right? No, that's not true. Is that true? It's only not true because you want to see if the actual, like you want your data to change so that you can see it as it's moving. Because right. uh, if you only had the start and the finish, then you'd see the tiny little arrow and then you'd right. see the finished arrow. Right. And that would not be a good user experience at all because mm -hmm. you wouldn't get a live preview. Um, but I remember in the very early versions of Goat, you'd have to click at the beginning and click at the end. That was true. But that was just because I was using a uh, mouse. I was doing on-click instead of mouse uh, down and up. Mm -hmm. And that was all the change I had to make. But the messages were actually always stayed the same. You still always had the continue button. Yes. Down. And that makes sense. Cool. All right. Well, good to know. Um, next, we've got some text area updates. So we have focus text area int. And I believe int would be a reference to which text area that we're clicking on. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, start editing text works similarly. Prevent text mouse down. Huh, what's that do? I think I might need to delete that, actually. I don't know. Oh, I, I think that this was... command clicked it and it didn't do anything. Uh, I brought you right back to the definition. Oh, because this right is here. where we defined it? Yes. Hmm. Um, I think that this was a message I was producing um, so that one of the... I think the mouse down on the edit would close out of the edits, like text area. Um, Wait, the mouse down on the edit. So oh, when we're right. editing text. Oh, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I think there, there's a way usually to say, like, prevent the stop propagation and stuff, but I think because it was, like, inside a foreign object or something in SVG, something was going. So this is, like, it might not be necessary anymore, but it's still here. So I just ignore it, honestly. Okay. All right. Uh, text box in input. So this is when we're actually typing in a text box. Um and we need to specify which text box, and then we also need to give it a record with a text value field and a state field. Mm -hmm. Auto expand dot state. Interesting. I'm gonna click on that. Oh, it looks like we have a whole auto expand file. It's actually a dependency. A dependency. Yeah. Um, so in our tree view, oh yeah, it's coming in as a package in Elm stuff. Yeah, so this is something someone else made. Mm -hmm. um, someone, uh, Ohani, am I saying yep. that right? Correct. Cool. Um, he actually made this and the keyboard extra package that we're using for all the keyboard commands. Okay. Good to know. Um, so I guess we don't need to dive too deep in here because no, it's we're just going to use it as an as an abstraction. Correct. Um, but what what does this mean though? Auto expand dot state. So uh, all he's actually tracking is the number of rows to put into your text box as you press enter, um, and so oh. he's doing some calculations based on the line height and whatnot. Um, so the only reason everything in Elm has to be in one place, right? Like it's an immutable data structure, and we're updating it. So even if a third-party library's code needs to update some state, we need to explicitly update it inside of our model. Mm -hmm. we, just don't, we, don't, we just don't know what's inside the helper functions they provide. So Ohani gives us his auto-expand.update, and we call that to update his state. So every time we get the message, we update his state too. Interesting. Okay. So then we have a finish editing text message with an, an int. Well, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, in intuitively, I wouldn't think you'd even need an int just because you're going to finish editing, and implicitly it would be whichever one you were editing. Mm -hmm. But that's tied an array of things, and we probably want to change the last. I'm not entirely sure if we do need an int either. So. Yeah, so uh, we might not need it, but might not for now it. it's explicit. Sure. All right. Uh, annotation attribute updates. So select fill. Uh, maybe color because we might have no fill at all. Um, select stroke color, definitely a color because we don't support having no an stroke. annotation with no stroke at all, um, which arguably makes or doesn't make sense for this kind of a shape, um, but it's just not supported. Certainly it makes sense for um, something like these, these free draw shapes where um, if, you, if you gave it, oops, it wasn't selected. If you gave it no stroke at all, it would just be completely invisible. Mm -hmm. So, so regardless, that's just not possible right now, and that's that's enforced here, um, and also because color is defined 
to absolutely be a color. It doesn't include the possibility of, of um, mm. being invisible. It's actually a core package, yeah. I guess it could, suppose, it could yeah, be you could invisible have, to zero. Uh, alpha zero. Correct. Hmm. So maybe we should make a, a type <laughs> for impossible to make invisible, right? <laughs> right. But <clears throat> for now, we're limited by the UI, which doesn't let us pick arbitrary colors. So not a, not a problem in effect. <laughs> mm -hmm. And maybe maybe it wouldn't even be a bad thing. I don't know. Maybe we would want to let people put whatever alpha they want. I don't know. Up to you, right, dear users? Okay, so, okay, so now we also have a select stroke style, which looks like this, so basically weight and also optional dashed attribute, so it looks kind of interesting. It's more fun when you're drawing it. <laughs> yeah. The dashed I'm going to go ahead and delete a couple uh, other annotations here. And like, look at that. No one needs that. <laughs> okay. I guess we can always restart at any time, too. <laughs> All right. So let's go back. Uh, control UI updates. So this has to do with the, the buttons and the menus that we have. So wait for drop down toggle, attribute drop down. Hmm. I wonder what that means. Wait for drop down toggle. And it takes an attribute drop down. I don't know what this means. So uh, if you go back to the app uh, itself, mm -hmm. to go play with it, uh, notice how some, the ones with ah. the arrows in the bottom right, um, you may not be obvious from the video recording, but right. Alan actually has to hold that for about 200 milliseconds, I believe, before the drop down appears. Right. Um, so I just click, nothing yeah. happens for a few hundred milliseconds, as opposed to this drop down where just a simple click brings up the menu. Mm -hmm. Um, can I right click these? Yes, yeah. so you can also right click to bring up the menu, but we're not currently preventing that. Maybe yeah, we're not doing anything with right click. Okay. So. Oh, we're not? Are you sure? No, no, no. If you right click. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can see it actually pops up it's after because It's because seconds. you had actually, yeah, yeah, 200 seconds. Interesting, though. That might be a bug. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, well, you know, potentially something could change. Um, okay. Cool. All right, um, so wait for drop down toggle is, I guess, then a message that we'll get when the mouse goes down, but we haven't finished waiting yet. And then cancel drop down wait would probably be what happens if I just mouse up too soon. Interesting. I wonder how we're able to differentiate those messages. Maybe we should take a look at that soon. Yeah. Uh, toggle drop down. Um, so I guess attribute drop down is just All the a type, downs. yeah, type yeah. definition. That, you can command click if you want. Right. I think we might have seen this already, where it's just all the different drop downs that there are. Yeah. So maybe it's a bad name, attribute drop down, because it can also be shapes and spotlights. But yeah. mm, right, because those are actually. Um, not attributes, but um, annotations. So maybe actually you can drawing type like control drop down. Oh. Yeah, or yeah, like um, control menu or something. Uh, okay, so where where were we before this? Okay, right, update. All right. So then we have change drawing, drawing. Which uh, what's going on here is when you can open a drop down, you can then change the type of shape that you're drawing. So here I'm selecting, you know, a square, round rect, or a circle, or, or a line, of course. Um, so there we go. Close drop down. And that could happen probably any number of ways. Maybe, probably not. I don't know. Maybe it's not. It's probably implicit to close the drop down when I actually change a value. Or do, what does that message get sent to? Uh, can we go back to the code for a second? Sure. Can you close drop down? Uh, I believe like there's an explicit um, reason. Oh, for escape. Mm -hmm, That's a message mm -hmm. just for escape. And probably if I just click out of it, right? Like, so here now it's open. If I just click here, oh, it doesn't actually. Mm, that. Should I implement that maybe? Probably. Probably. Right. And that's where that um, mask that you tried to change the visibility is for is for any drop down that you're showing any menu. Maybe I can click that, and then that way, 
we can dismiss all the menus. Oh, okay. So, yeah. How about that? Okay. So it'd be very easy to implement if we wanted to do it. Good. Um, we have selection updates. Um, sorry, that little talk about it. Reset to ready to draw. Okay. So that that makes sense if we remember ready to draw now renamed to not selecting. Yeah, I should probably rename um, this too. <laughs> so now we have something selected, and if I just click away from it, then I'm assuming the message that was sent was reset to ready to draw. Yep. And I got a little thumbs up from Greg there. <laughs> okay. So re select annotation um, takes an integer, and um, again we've we've kind of talked th about this before, but the way that the Go app is differentiating which annotation you're interacting with and selecting is by giving them all um, a unique ID integer, that uh, UID I think we saw earlier. It's actually just the index of them and the array. That's oh, sorry. Identify them. Yeah. yeah, but that's, okay. so maybe it's uh, worth it to even call that, like I could do that type alias index mm. equals int and then you would know, you know, oh, that's an, that's an index. Yeah. So, something to consider. Oh, good, good to know. I'm just going to undo some stuff again actually and there's no complete on demo without a little, you know, undo, redo. showing off of undo redo, right? So, mm. all right. So, it's a rule. Um, so, reset, ready to draw, select annotation, and then select and move annotation. Interesting. Hmm. So, I guess that would be if we have an annotation and then I just start dragging it right away. So I don't have to go through, it's kind of like a, a double whammy of moving into selecting and then moving right away. Good to know, okay. Um, move updates, start moving annotation. So I guess that would be if it's selected and then I start dragging it. Um, I get, I, yeah, I'm not sure why that's a thing as well as move annotation. Why is that? Um, for start and moving annotation versus like select and move. I'm not necessarily oh, but, sure. Uh, that's because it takes the start position, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and the end. Mm, yeah. Sorry. I see. I think I see. I think if we go back to our model, I think this might make more sense. Um, so our edit state, oh, I'm going to click here. We had moving. And moving info, I'm going to click on that, takes the ID, start position, uh, basically the move, the translation. Um, and in this context, just for anyone who might not be clear, when we talk about moving shapes, that's also called a translate. You're just moving up and over or whatever direction. It's called translation. It has nothing to do with language. And then um, attributes, which again, is this concept of just showing the current attributes in the, in the uh, control box. So if we go back to um, where were we in an update here, um, it looks like these messages are pretty much giving us the information we need uh, kind of progressively. So once you start moving, you'll just make a note of which annotation ID that is. Um, or it's saying ID again, but again, the, the end. The Same thing. Answer. We can think of them as the unique identifiers, um, right? right? Because all, yeah, it doesn't matter what the data structure purposes. is. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we start collecting that for the for the model. Um, wait, we're, oh, here we go. We're using edit state. Um, so we grab that that ID, and of course we can initialize the start position at that time and translate it just be zero zero. Mm -hmm. And also, just to note, um, maybe what Alan's pointing out is that there might be some redundancies in these messages, and that might um, become that might have become much more obvious since the refactor I just did to make it into a true state machine. So mm -hmm. that, like, if the function only requires an int, and we already know what it is, then it makes sense to um, not have a message that is separate. But uh, very often, I don't know the internals of the state machine, right? So I don't know what the selected ID is um, in the state machine. Mm -hmm. So that's usually why I need it from the message from the user. Interesting. Well, um, hmm. well, regardless, it does make some sense to, to consider that you would, if nothing else, like maybe we don't need this in right here if it's already selected, which I think it would be. But that said, it definitely makes sense that you would skip it as you're moving it because you're already in that moving state. You're just updating that translation 
value. Mm -hmm. um, and then we finished moving, at which point, going back to that, that diagram that we saw, um, you know, when you're done moving the annotation, you would follow the arrow all the way back to just being a selected annotation again. <coughs> we have some resize updates here. So we have um, a start resizing annotation, um, which takes an int to represent which annotation we're resizing, uh, which vertex is, is being used to control the resizing, right? Correct. And a start position, so that would be the, the starting position of that vertex. Mm -hmm. Do we want to see the definition of vertex? Sure. Let's take a quick look at that. Mm -hmm. You're in the mode again. Which... Well, how am I doing that? I don't know how you keep escaping to the remote. You must be pressing escape or something. Try again. Hmm. I don't know. I, th I think it's well, just the atom editor. Whatever. Um, yeah, sorry, folks. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Should we go with that? I think we can find it. Should be imported up to the top. Yes, so it's inside the annotation um, file. Vertex should be here. Yes. Mm. Oh wow, look at this. So vertices are classified by their relationship to the start and end mouse positions that created the annotation. Um, example, assume a top left to bottom right draw. Um, start, start plus x are the top, top left and right coordinates respectively, and then on the bottom we have start plus y and end. And again, um, in SVG drawing land, the zero, zero coordinate is the top left one. <clears throat> so, um, so vertex is a union, and it's either start and start plus x or start plus plus y, as we just saw illustrated above. It says um, annotations are viewed differently based on the kind of selection. Selected corresponds to annotations that are not in a state for resizing or moving, just select it. This is currently relevant only to text boxes when they're being edited. Interesting. I should actually add an addendum um, that uh, selected kind of means a little more now is with the free draw uh, edition, those aren't vertices on that selection either because you can't resize your um, vertex, uh, your freehand drawing. So, oh. um, so I have it be a selected state. So perhaps I should have the documentation. So easy for documentation to go out of date from the code. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Selected with vertices shows vertices on any annotation that allows for resizing and moving, <clears throat> which, as we just noted, does not include the free draw. Mm -hmm. Free draw can be moved, but it can't be resized. So maybe we should just specify this only to resizing. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, not selected shows the unadorned annotation. Um, okay, so there's a select state for annotation. Mm. Okay. Well, I don't know if we want to spend a whole lot of time in yeah, annotation here. right now. We just we're here for the vertex. Maybe go back to update them. Yeah. We were almost done with all the messages for the entire app. <laughs> and this mm -hmm. is all of their. Um, yeah, it's a lot of code. But yeah, so. we're just looking at the uh, the initial union here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we were at resize updates, and then we're we can yeah. see the end. The goats are down there. <laughs> yeah, great. All right, so we have the the resizing messages, and then we have um, an annotation menu updates. Um, was that the thing? Yeah. Okay. As you can see here, it includes the bring annotation to back or or front. Um, commands that we support. Well, by commands, I'm, I'm speaking from a user interface perspective, not an Elm perspective. Um, and then toggle annotation menu. It looks like it makes sense to draw the menu at a certain position, obviously. And then toggle selected annotation menu. What is that? So if you toggle, if you right click anywhere on that drawing area, mm -hmm. it will show you the menu, but it will be disabled. Um, all the options because right now I only support two options. Send to but oh, no, so, so these are disabled right yeah, now. Yeah, but when you select annotation and right click, then you will be able to get both of those. Right. So. Cool. Okay. 
and then we have history updates so this is pretty okay this is going to be fairly obvious what's going on here uh, we should take a look at reset too real quick so all, all these four commands together are just simply put or again messages really <clears throat> these messages are the ones that will be sent to our app from these buttons mm -hmm. so obviously undo uh, redo and then um, save which is what generates an, an output image this is actually a rendered PNG that we created um, very important to you know the whole purpose of the editor Mm -hmm. um, and then back, which takes us back to the goat selection page. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. It just keeps it. Uh, keeps that's because that's JavaScript. It's actually yeah. rendering the. DOM. So this is yeah, this is outside of our Elm document or whatever. Not yeah. document, but you know what I mean. Yeah, the Elm app. Yeah. Okay, and then we have uh, select image, of course, which just takes us to that uh, selecting edit state. Um, no, that's not true. Sorry, this is where you pick the image to edit. Yep. Uh, set images, so that's where we get our list of images to choose from to pick it. I think yeah. just from Zendesk at this point, uh, okay. or when we click on the goats as like default images, we get a list of images from that. Right. And then we have return to image selection. Oh, huh. Well, this is interesting because return to image selection is what, you what happens when you click back. Correct. But I thought that was reset. Is there a reset? So there used to be a reset, but mm -hmm. reset now is actually just for um, when this is in the context of Zendesk. Okay. Um, there's like when you when you finish an image, um, it should bring you back like away from that image. So it resets all the state um, to like the beginning. Uh, so that's just how I built the feature for the Zendesk context. I see. So we won't see it in the web today. No. All right. Good to know. Uh, keyboard updates. Keyboard message. Keyboard dot message. Okay. Um, and that would be coming from, is this a built-in library, Keyboard? Uh, keyboard is a uh, Elm Lang library. It's not um, installed by default, mm -hmm. but you can install it. It's maintained by like Evan and the Elm Software Foundation. Okay. Um, and then I am also using, I said an alias, I said keyboard.extra as keyboard, because I wanted all the extra stuff. Um, and so that's actually coming from Ohani's libraries. So. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And nice. that's at the top of the page if you want to read that. So. Right. Uh, keyboard.extra. Yeah, yeah, here we go. What does this mean, key, and then mm. this little emoticon? So key is actually a union type. So if you if you can actually command click on that, we can try it one more time see if it works. Nope. Damn, I think it's because you were selecting something and then... Oh. Um, so uh, that key definition is uh, actually all the different possible keys um, written in plain English uh, to, uh, to present. So like shift and... I believe this would be best uh, searched. Yeah, so we can see here that there's the shift key is being used quite a bit. Um, and yeah, whether or not, or in care Z and super and control, these are all ah. the keyboard extra keys. Nice. Um, you could do them by key code, mm -hmm. uh, which is what the Elm language library uh, supplies, but mm -hmm. keyboard extra gives us all these nice names. Nice, yeah, that's very readable then. It makes sense. I don't even have to read this code to know we're looking at undo and redo when I see care Z everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Instead of care code, whatever. I'm ashamed to admit I don't have that memorized. We're all ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, well, <clears throat> what should we look at next? So I guess we, did we finish looking at all the uh, possible? I think we're almost Almost. There. We pretty much finished. So, um, Return to image selection we just looked at and talked about reset and everything. Keyboard message, um, right. So that, that supports a whole bunch of keyboard shortcuts and keyboard based commands then. Um, so if we hover on this icon, hmm, I really expected it's what's up to come up. Oh, here we go, yeah. It does, it's just weird how the browser defaults work to me. Yeah, I probably jiggled the mouse a little more than I should have. So arrow is A. Um, so just to demo that, I'm going to type A, and then you can see it switched to the arrow. I'm going to go ahead and pick um, a color and draw a nice uh, pink arrow. So we're going to nowhere. All right. And then modal updates close all menus. Fair enough. I can see why that might be useful sometimes. Eventually in the future, um, there will probably be more menus that pop up. Um, 
possibly for like reporting bugs and other things. So it'd be nice to have them all be unified under one dismiss all when you click on the modal mask. Cool. Wow. Well, look at this. We reached our update function. Um, we might as well take a brief look at this. Yeah, I, I think just scroll through it and if anything jumps out as weird to you, please let me know. Yeah. Look at the type signature of it. We got the uh, takes message and model um, and then updates the model and optional gives us a list of commands. Um, so, oh, this is interesting. I'm a little surprised to see a record here. So, like I would have expected to use just model. Yeah. Right. So, we are actually still calling it model over mm -hmm. there with as model. And what's happening is we're just destructuring certain fields that I care about. I don't want to have to type model dot, model uh, dot, model dot all the way through this right. function. So, I unpack some of the fields. But just some of the fields. So does that mean that our model includes more fields than this? Mm -hmm. And then we're, we're just implicitly, how do we get them implicitly? Uh, we, would, uh, we wouldn't we would get them implicitly. We have to be explicit. So in this oh, case, right. we're unpacking the ones Sorry. we care about referencing as just mm -hmm. that name. And then anything I want, uh, anything that we want in the update function, we have to do model dot that's not included in that list. So I should almost kind of think of this backwards. I should think of it as update, you know, taking argument message and taking argument model. And then also we're going to refer to some parts of model Correct. by destructuring them. Mm -hmm. So in my head, it makes more sense to think of this phrase kind of right to left. Sure. All right. Um, then of course, we're going to have our famous uh, case statement. Um, and I feel like even though we haven't really taken a look at this function before, there shouldn't be many surprises here. Just naively, I'm thinking that because we've already looked at the messages that we can get, and we've looked at our model itself. So, not to you know devalue the update, but like it's just bridging them. It's just cycling the the messages in to create updates to the model, and so so there will be things here that we haven't seen, but. Is kind of just gluing things together that we want to look at. Mm -hmm. All right. So start drawing um, takes a position and a model so that we can update our state. That's interesting. Okay, so we actually call the start drawing function, mm -hmm. giving it a position and a model because of that um, forward function app. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, the forward function applicator, as I think we were going to call it. Uh, Sure. I, uh, I just like calling these pipes. Pipes, but, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll trust you, your judgment on that. So uh, a pipe then. And uh, and and these things I took I took a look at, this syntax I took a little, little bit of a look at earlier today. Um, and I'm still not like 100% on it, but I think I understand what's going on here. It's pretty much that you're saying, um, you know, whatever the result is of the previous expression, I guess. Mm -hmm. You want to pass it in as an argument to the last argument. The last, argument. the last argument, right? Right. So we're to calling start drawing this function position model. We'll give it position and model, and then it returns. And this returns what does start drawing return? It will return. Um, well, we can look um, at it. if we. It will probably click on return it. Um, a model. Yeah, if we click on it, remember that tooltip right. that was showing. Oh, um, sorry. Or even just yeah, so that one was saying that takes a model. Okay, well, that tooltip can get a little annoying. Actually. Yeah. Okay. Start drawing. So. Uh, it returns a model, right? Mm -hmm. Takes a model in start position and gives us a model, and that makes sense. Okay, so that's interesting that um, actually it said start position, so we talked about that earlier. Um, position has, well, it can be their start or end position. Um, and we just, looks like it just comes in as, I don't know, we're not, I don't see a type annotation right here. And that comes from where we define that message. Oh, the start drawing message? Mm -hmm. um, should I click it? We can see it works. Yeah. That's okay. Oh, nope, oh, oh, okay. Here it is. Yeah. So, um, it just says position. But we talked about this earlier that it might actually just take a start position. That would be fine. Yeah. So we try that. Sure. Go ahead. Um. All oh, right. The clicking will be annoying on the recording, but we're just gonna type a couple letters, and I'm gonna let's see. Uh, say. 
and switch over to our terminal. Uh, looks like it's finished recompiling, so we've over here got the library load going, and um, looks looks like it works to me. Yeah. All right, great. So cool. Um, and I guess we could call this one end position, not that it would sure. matter. Yeah. But we'll we'll go back. Or yeah, we don't need to do that now. I think the point's been made. Um, sorry, we're just looking at our update function. Cool. And so we also call our close dropdown function. So I'm starting to see the value of of pipe now. Um, in a in a non Elm architecture kind of app, I would think of these things as just functions that mutate a state, and or or like they go take care of the particular states that are involved. Like if uh, there is a drop down state somewhere, you know, again, not thinking in terms of like a giant model, but just like you have a drop down and you need to close it by removing a class on a DOM element mm -hmm. or, or updating a backbone model or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I would go take care of that. And so it's kind of like I would I would naturally compose this function of just like various um, um, what's the phrase I'm looking for um, procedural you know commands essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, procedural uh, is like a way to look at the piping, but ultimately it's all returning to which is an interesting right. Change. So so right. So how we make changes in an Elm architecture application is by um, always a or mutate not mutating, but we, we we take in a model and then we we create a new model that's based on the same on that model except with some updated fields. Yeah. And since and that's all these functions are doing is they're saying, okay, give me the the existing model and in this case a position and um, we're gonna update the state based on you know whatever start drawing does. And then we say also we would like to update the model to close any drop downs that are open. Mm -hmm. And this model, when we're talking about closed dropdown, is the result of after applying start drawing. So it's oh okay. It's coming. So these pipes are it's 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 ordering right. Right. Yeah. Although, correct me if I'm wrong. In this case, it probably wouldn't matter. In this case, it wouldn't. No. But if you said something like finish drawing and then um, start uh, and then like draw continue drawing, mm -hmm. that that ordering the state right. machine would enforce that you can't do that. Right. Right. Instance. Yeah. Naturally. Right. So so it does happen in order. Of course, it's just that. In both of these cases, we want to give them a model to um, to base their changes on, mm -hmm. and so we see that same pattern kind of happening down here. Even though, like this, in this case, because this is so simple, you really wouldn't even need this operator. You could just say continue drawing, pause, and then model. Correct. It's just you're continuing the pattern that you've set up here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we see our, our little friend the the rocket here. Mm -hmm. Because again, um, since we do have to worry about commands now in this application, we, we have to return an empty list of commands here. Or rather, just an empty list. And it doesn't need to be commands if there are somebody in there, but mm -hmm. they're not. <laughs> um, right. So like it's kind of like if we never had any commands, we would just go through and get rid of all these lines, right? Totally. But we, we need to. We do them. have some. <laughs> yeah. OK. Yeah. Well, Actually, we go take a look now at focus text area because we actually have some commands now. Mm -hmm. So this this is actually interesting. I think um, so. Focus text area needs to know which text area to focus on. Uh, we always start with our existing model or current state, and then it looks like we use the little pipe guy to uh, start editing text. Um, so we we um, have a new model now, and we're done with our model changes. But then we're not done because we have some commands. And so, this is interesting. Um, looks like we're constructing a string here. So, text box edit dash dash one, say. Um, and then that string we want to pass in as the second, sorry, the only argument to the dom.focus mm -hmm. function. Um, and then the result of dom.focus function which it tells me here is going to be a task 
in it with either and probably either with an air or a tuple. So that's actually the empty tuple is called the unit type, um, meaning like it doesn't uh, return anything. So focus doesn't return anything because you don't need anything. It's just doing an imperative um, mm. like focus. Uh, okay, so yeah, it, has, so it doesn't give result. us anything back. It just does it. Yeah. It's pure side effect, essentially. Yeah, basically. Um, unless it fails. Um, well, that's the thing is that any side effect can fail, right? Mm. So that's why they have to be given an explicit error mm -hmm. and a success. And so, yeah, then it gets piped to the mm. next thing, which... But this is synchronous. Like, it's going to go do it. Yeah, and, right, it's a synchronous thing. Well, well um, no, because we're describing it because it's a command. We're just describing it, yeah. Right, so it's not going to, right now in the code, it's not going to go do it. It's just going to remember mm -hmm. that it needs to go execute yeah. this. Link. An important thing to know is that after calling dom.focus, mm -hmm. we actually don't have a command yet, right? Because when we were clicking on that with the tooltip, we saw that it returns a task. Um, I like to think of tasks, and I think uh, Evan also explained it this way, as to-do lists. Okay. Like, here's all the things we need to go do. Um, maybe right. we, like we go get the groceries and then we go and cook and then we do these things and at any point in those we can fail so we have to have that error case in there in this case dom.error mm -hmm. um, and so we just have to turn that task into a command and interesting here you can see the uh, dom.focus function signature takes a, a dom.id so that tells me that what we constructed right here wasn't just a string of any special of any sort, but but in fact specifically going to be used as a selector. I'm guessing to um, to look up the element with that ID. Correct. Um, but anyway, we saw that the result of this um, function, DOM the focus function, is um, a, a task, and then we're going to pass that in as an argument here. So we're calling task attempt, which Wow, it takes, it takes in a tuple, um, a result tuple, and a task, and returns a command. So actually, even though you see the parentheses, mm -hmm. it's actually not a tuple, but oh, a, a tuple. function. Oh, it's right, a, a function, yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm sorry, so it takes a result function, interesting, and, um, and a task. Task. This might be best explained if we looked at try to edit. Actually. This this kind of makes sense though. Again, okay. from an object oriented perspective, it's always tempting to think of dot, you know, something that something as invoking a method on an object. Of course, that's not how things work in mm -hmm. Elm. So this is just saying like, um, like I don't know how you would actually describe this, but the attempt function belongs to task, like the what, task module, like the task module. Okay, yep. so using the task module. So we're not calling attempt on a task until we actually give it a task to attempt. Mm -hmm. And the task that we're going to give it to attempt was created by dom.focus. Correct. So in this case, again, we're going to give it a function, which is try to edit. Actually, that's false. We're not going to give it the try to edit function. I'm going to show off my, my knowledge of partial application. Ooh, cool. So what we're going to do here is we're partially applicating <laughs> That's probably not a phrase people say. <laughs> we're going to uh, to give, I don't know, we're going to partially evaluate or apply whatever Yeah. the uh, try to edit function by giving it the argument index already. Uh, let's look at try to edit. It looks like it takes an, an integer, that's our index, and also a result, and then returns a message. So, so at the end of the day, or not at the end of the day, but after we we evaluate um, this little expression, uh, we will have a function that takes one argument, a result argument. And if you go back to our description of uh, task.attempt, you can see it wants a function that takes one argument. Um, one argument. Right, the... Um, the result argument, right? Mm -hmm. Result argument and returns a message. Yeah. Um, as well as the task. So so again, we're giving it a function that takes a result and also a task. Um, and at the end, task will return, the task.attempt rather will return to us a command.
Wow. Okay. So that's, that's pretty that's pretty dense, right? Yeah. yeah. But uh, but you actually covered. You didn't misspeak on any of those points. That was awesome. awesome. Yeah. Um, Great. I think we should look at try to edit just because that's a lot of words. Okay. And try to edit is a, actually a pretty simple function. So yeah. I think it's really useful to go look at it. Cool. Again, so so just trying to put this into like human language, like as human languages, programmers ever speak. Um, mm -hmm. We're we're going to try to down dot focus on on this. Uh, or rather, you know, this. Um, and then assuming that succeeds, we will try to edit the the text box with this index and the result of our focus, mm -hmm. which is really not that important because it, it just happened. Yeah, right? It's, it's like... Nothing has happened we're yet. We're not going to use the value of dom.focus's result. We're yes. just... Like, the fact that it can give us an error would like stop us from then proceeding and doing more things, right? I've done the happy path, yeah. Okay. So. so yeah, I agree. I think we should absolutely go take a look at try to edit. Um, and so that is in, up. it's still an update.helm. Here it is. So try to edit takes the integer. We, we already know what that is. That's the index we provided when we were partially applying this, this function. Am I saying that right? How would you say that differently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. Uh, so when you uh, partially applied it, um, it just means that it was it was wait it was had a function ready to be evaluated that only took one argument. So it was just the, it was try to edit with index already saved in, in a way. Scoped, right. Basically. Right. Right. Um, and we also want that result as an argument, and we return a message, mm -hmm. and the result could potentially. Include a DOM dot error or an empty empty. What was this again? Uh, that's called the unit type. The unit so, type. Yeah. Okay. Still a little fuzzy on that. Unit just means like a value that. Uh, I guess you can think of it as null. When it actually when it when we port between Elm and JavaScript, if mm -hmm. you send null, it comes into Elm. Um, unless you explicitly say it's a maybe. Um, it comes in as the unit type. So it's just mm. it's something we just don't care about. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah. Uh, all right. And so we let's take an actual look at the function body now. Um, since result could be an error or not. Um, it is a union type. Uh, being a union type and, and a, a special one built into the uh, It's a built-in, yes. It's in the basics package. Uh, if it's okay... Um, then we start editing text with that index that we've, um, I almost said memoized, <laughs> uh, with the index that we um, we provided earlier. Um, what's this underscore doing? So that would be the unit type. Um, we could we could even have it, um, I believe, look like this. I'm not entirely sure if that's a valid syntax. Um, looks like there's no errors right now. So yeah, so this is the unit type. Um, so it's just something that like mm. we can't use this for anything, right? Like none of right. our messages take a unit type. There's no need. Oh, so I'm just cool. ignoring it. So the underscore is a great that's way right. to forgot say about I don't care. It's like I don't care. It's like yeah. look, something's gonna pass me a value here, but I don't care. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's something. Again, it's been a little while since I did very much Elm. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I've never done much Elm, but, <laughs> but what Elm, Elm I have done was was a couple months ago. Sure. For the most part. Okay. Cool. So that's that's good to know. So we'll just bring that right back there. Okay. Uh, and then the case of an error. Oh, wow. And then the case of an error, we just undo. That was just uh, me, you know, just having an effect. In case it failed, I just undid the, the thing you were doing, like something went wrong. That's probably not the best error handling. But it I was forced to handle risky, it. Sounds risky. Because maybe we haven't even completed an undoable action yet. Uh, well, so you would, yeah, I mean, depending on how I coded it, yeah, you could be undoing an action. Interesting. So I could just present a message to the user. I could have mm -hmm. a message to come in. Right now, it could, it could return, like, show error message. Yeah. And say, like, something went wrong. If we think wrong. about this, the only time that um, that we would fail would be if we had some sort of error in our view um, such that we thought we had a text box with a certain index, and we didn't. Yeah. Right? Or, like... Or if we misconstructed the string to represent that ID, like we had a mismatch in that. Yeah. So this is something that like 
can't necessarily get with type safety, but you can get with good testing. Mm. You know, making sure that that is always there in the view code, making sure that this is oh, that that index is always present in the array. Yeah. Now, just thinking about this as a JavaScript developer, in this case, this is the kind of error that I would expect to never happen if my code's correct. Mm -hmm. But if it does happen, I want to know about it and I want to fix it. Yeah. Um, so I would I would be tempted to just make it fail hard. Mm -hmm. um, is that something we can do? Can we just fail hard? Yeah. But what? So when you say fail hard, what do you want? If you want it to like, like crash I'm the like, program? Yeah, like throw an exception. So uh, yeah, if you want that, you can write debug.crash. Oh, and wow. that will bring the program to a halt completely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it will give you a message that you put. It's debug.crash takes a string. Mm -hmm. And it just gives you that message and then gives you um, contextual information of where you were in the code. So it's very useful for when you don't know, um, like, oh, well, I can't, like, let's say I wanted to grab out of an array. And, like, mm -hmm. you know, in the case that I don't, I don't get anything, I want it to crash because I want to see if that happens. Okay. Rather than something. So this is a way of, like, to the user, yeah, something undid. And that's not great. Um, and so we should probably present some kind of message or whatnot, but really, um, cause you never want to ship debug.crash code to production cause that will okay. bring the entire app down. Yeah. Right? Like, like it's actually dead in the water. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying crash hard for the user and say like, Hey, please report this to a developer, mm -hmm. then we should actually have a message here, like show error message. And then in so our, we would, you would want to try and survive it, but produce something. Yeah. Like, say, like something you like could that. do something like turn off the text box feature. And then have everything else be fine. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the right UI and design decision mm -hmm. is here, but the point is, Elm is making you handle the case that you mess something up, like yeah. something's messed up in your code, and it's making you do something about it. Yeah. For me, it was undoing that annotation. Yeah. Um, which is not necessarily the best uh, handling case. I pretty much wrote this code when I was prototyping, mm -hmm. and a type check, so it's good. But the best thing is um, like going back and revisiting these error cases. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, so you're seeing... Really like, interesting. Well, it sounds like we don't know the very best way to handle it. So, uh, dear listeners, if you uh, have a really good idea here, I think we'd like to hear it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, that, that was pretty interesting. Um, what should we look at now, do you think, Greg? Uh, let's go back to the update function a little bit. Okay. Um, and maybe we just do a kind of high-level skim onto, like, mm -hmm. is there anything else that stands out to yeah. you? Because uh, you don't need to necessarily read the line by line, but see that mm -hmm. everything is, you know, kind of what you would expect if anything jumps out to you. Right. Like, this one definitely did. Mm -hmm. Being an interesting, like, the first example of a command I think we really took a look at. Yeah. Um, okay, so start editing text. Uh, this one seems, again, very similar to the pattern we've seen already. Um, well, if something jumps out at you, Greg, just go ahead and uh, make a note of it. Sure. Um, I'll do the same. Hmm. Set images. Okay. So this is uh, not, I don't know, maybe it's not that interesting. But it, the syntax here is noteworthy. Just in that, I think this is the first time today we've really looked at this um, this this syntactical sugar that Elm has for updating a record. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually the only way to update a record. Um, so when you when you want to change what what is in a field, um, but yeah, so we, most of these I put into helper functions, and that's why there's those pipes. Mm. Um, and in this case, it was just as a right. small update. I just haven't made the helper function yet. But yeah. If I wanted to test it, you can bet that I will make it a helper I function see. because why not? It would make it easy to test. Makes sense to me. So. Cool. So we're just, yeah. What does list.zipper do? Uh, that is an interesting library for anyone listening to check out. Um, it's a data structure, that's a, it's a functional data structure that asserts that there is always a selection within a list that's valid. So, oh, right. Yeah, it forces you to have a selection. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you see that image selected Boolean right next to it, this isn't actually always true of my app. You can uh, like cancel the image that you're currently editing and mm -hmm. go and select another image. Mm -hmm. But I retain that always as, um, well, we always know what the selected image is um, or what the last one was, so that in case we ever wanted to add a next and previous, like that would work perfectly. Mm -hmm. We never have, um, we never had to test for the case that the selection is outside the list or the list goes out of sync with the mm -hmm. index. Mm -hmm. So um, this is just a nice abstraction to say, you definitely are selecting one of these elements. Okay. All right, we haven't really seen much let 
I don't think we've seen any of that today that we talked about. Mm -hmm. So this is the case of um, keyboard message. So when our update function gets a keyboard message, we definitely want the key message argument. We have to know something about what key or keys are being pressed. Um, so my understanding of let, which is not very strong in Elm, is that it, it gives us a way to um, define some variables for temporary use. Sure, you can think of it like that. Totally. Hmm. How would you describe it? Um, I def I dis I def uh, define it as another scope. So like this module is a scope, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we could call this like we could have a new function at the top level. Yeah. Or we could have a function inside this let expression. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a performance advantage to having less let functions, by the way. Oh really? Uh, which is interesting. Um, and so you want to keep them usually to a minimum by just breaking things out early to the top level scope. But in this case, it's useful because um, update with key changes returning to values that I want to use. Okay. So. All right. So so, right. Of course, in your assignment, you got to start on the right side here. So, keyboard dot update with key change is a function we're going to call. Um, I wonder what this does. Let's see. Wow. So it's using keyboard extra, in some way, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how deep I want to go on this. I don't know. What do you I think? think? A, I think a simple, simple thing would be, I think we have the doc pages up in mm -hmm. the Chrome tab. Okay, and let's we can just over. go and look at uh, one of these. Yeah, one of guy? these. Yeah. Keyboard extra. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've heard you mention this um, module a few times. I think you're a big fan of it. Is that fair <laughs> to say? That's fair, yeah. Um, and I think maybe it'd be a really good um, one to click on this example here. Um, for tracking key changes, as it's a little LE app that we can compile and see oh, the code wow. next mm -hmm. to the um, next to the example. This is a nice little fade out LE does for us. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna click compile. Shout out to Humble Spark and Luke for making this tool. It's been really nice. Nice. Um, try pressing, releasing, and long pressing keys. So I'm just gonna hit A. Okay. Wow. All right. Well. Super exciting. <laughs> oh, just it's kind of cool that when you long press, you know, um, I believe it was. Did we see it repeat at all? I, I don't think I did. Oh, okay. But we're on a Mac, and so on Mac by default, long pressing these keys doesn't repeat them anymore. It's been changed so that oh. you're able to, like, if I were actually typing right now in a text area, I'll just go ahead and do it right here, for example. The push and hold brings up this menu. Yeah, I forgot about that. Cool. So that's probably why we're not seeing anything too interesting there. It'd be interesting to see it on Windows. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so in this um, program, uh, he this is an example to show off that exact function you were talking about, um, the update with key change. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. I think maybe so, the docs would be a better place, actually, now that I think of it, um, like where we were before, mm -hmm. unless you want to try to understand this code, because it's, it's the same right. thing. Right, well, I don't want to get too deep into it, but, I mean, would it be fair to cons to consider uh, Keyboard Extra pretty much just a really nice API for getting these, what, does it let us kind of subscribe to key presses? Is that what's going on? Yeah, it is subscribing to key presses, mm -hmm. and then it just, um, whenever we call this update with that keyboard message, it is just returning to us a list of the keys that are currently pressed, mm. and then what was the actual key change. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. what the update with key changes is, is just giving ah. us that tuple with an extra, mm -hmm. um, you know, information of which key it was. Right. So if I did like Shift A, mm -hmm. it it's telling us which one changed, but it's not showing me here like that more than what oh debug. So, yeah, maybe if we see in debugger, we can kind of piece All together. Right, so I'm going to do shift A again. Oh, what? no, I don't have focus. Oops. There you go. Um, sorry. Okay. So, um, we got to collapse this one. These are just the key changes, right? Oh, right. Maybe the pressed, pressed keys. keys. Okay, so if we look at the pressed keys here. You can see sometimes there's one down, sometimes there's two down. Okay, so this mm -hmm. is when I had shift and A pressed both. So the key change. Uh, no, that's the list that's been built. It's been building. Um, is the are the latest ones the big numbers or the small numbers? I believe it's the big ones. Yeah. Um, um, or if I'm not well, entirely. Oh no, it's probably adding to the front of the list the, because it's more performant to add to the front of. Okay. A list. So. All right, yeah, so so at this point, 
and time we had just pressed A while shift was still pressed. And that's what this is trying to show us right here. So then the next thing that happened was I, I must have released A. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see that over here. It says TFA. I forgot that it changes that. That's very nice. Okay, cool. So, so I can see that's a nice API to use. And then, um, so, hmm. So is there something about this syntax that's, um, like, uh, confusing to you at all? Um, no, I don't think so. Maybe. Um, we're just, we're calling that function to get that information. Uh, and again, I have to stop myself from thinking of this in terms of object-oriented programming, right? Like, this is just the module that provides a function, and then, like, it has no data. It has no yeah. object that it's pulling from. We have to give that information to it. Exactly. So we're doing that here. Um, and for a moment, I started to think, well, you know, we talked about this kind of being a, a way to subscribe to keyboard changes. Yeah. And, and I, I wonder... Well, how is that happening? Like all I see here is we're just calling a function. Like that sounds like we're gonna go ask for the information, I not see. like we're hearing it. So but yeah, of so, course, so keyboard message doesn't come from that function, right? It comes right. It, no, and, we got it here because yeah, yeah. we'd already gotten the message. Correct. Right. So this is just pretty much a utility mm -hmm. coming from this this um, module that yeah. lets us work with that message easily. Exactly, because we actually don't know anything about that message, which is, right. the, that's the abstraction. Which is right, cool. cool, yeah. And so, but what is this pressed keys though, because... Um, that is the list of keys that are pressed that um, the API asks for you to keep in your model. Um, so you always have access to your list of keys that's pressed. It's not opaque to you. So you just pass it a list of um, keys. Oh, of previously pressed keys. Yeah. From before. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And so, if we scroll back up, what I'm what I'm hearing you say is that this is something we destructured up here, right? Correct. Look at that. Okay. So we destructured that out of our model. So we knew um, from before what uh, what keys had been pressed. Mm -hmm. Cool. And and like recursion isn't the right word for this, but but kind of has a similar. I'm thinking of it kind of almost similar to recursion because of the way that the model just keeps being updated and updated and updated and updated and and there like the result here is probably going to be kind of the result of um, you know our initial state and then a bunch of iterations of of probably that that same message yes you know over yeah. and over I like to think of the update as like it's a game loop and this is any time that you're looking at this update function is just one one piece of time mm -hmm. you know you're never even, you're not even thinking of time actually which is one thing that I really like when Elm moved away from uh, signals. There's an episode actually um, of a podcast called Elm Town that uh, explains its history, but it's nice that when you're in this update function, you're never thinking of time. You're just thinking of, I have a new message. I want to do things with that message. Mm. Um, and so when you were asking a little bit before, like this is just a function, right? It's just returning these new press keys and like whatever change happened. Right. Um, and you're like, well, where do we get this message from? I think this is a good time to just go check out the subscriptions file. Sure. Yeah, let's uh, let's do that. First, I wanted to take a quick look just here because what I'm seeing is, you know, the result of our thing appears to be a tuple that we're destructuring. Correct. And so I just want to make sure that the type signature matched that yeah. just to check my understanding. And so what I see here is that, um, yeah, the first thing we get is a list of keys, and that's why you're calling it new press keys. And then you're getting um, a maybe. Um, possibly with um, a key change and so you're calling that maybe key change mm -hmm. cool and then so these I'm gonna call them variables sure that's fine unless there's a better word for it uh, maybe maybe bindings I'm not sure because they never change right it's like right. constant JavaScript like we never actually update uh, right but it'd be confusing to think of a let like a const yeah just think of it as <laughs> <laughs> just think of it right. as yeah think of it as variables we're gonna call them variables mm -hmm. um will only exist for this in clause right this in expression yeah only for this um and so what we do with it is we <laughs> duh, update our model right nice uh okay and what i what i don't see here though uh is a rocket our rocket buddy. Well, why don't you click yeah. on uh, handle keyboard interactions? Oh, so he probably 
gives us a model and yeah. gives the commands. Mm-hmm. All right, very nice. Sometimes you'll notice that the rocket's not there, and that's because um, it means that there must be conditionally commands. Mm-hmm. Like certain things produce commands, so certain things have empty. So that's the only reason you wouldn't see a rocket um, in these updates. Got it. Um, okay, so you said we should go take a look at our subscriptions. Sure. Um, and that's great. I think we should do that. And I just wanted to complete another loop, though, with our our pressed keys. Like, at this point, how we're talking about, you know, having an initial state and then updating pressed keys, um, which we do right here, um, you know, every, every time we get a new keyboard message coming in, um, I just want to circle back to our initial model, which, which uh, should have no keys pressed. So I'm just going to go take a look at that. And so you can see actually here, we do default to just an empty list. Cool. All right, so let's go look at our subscriptions. Um, I'm going to close some folders. OK, so source. Probably not in drawing area under view or view at all, actually. Subscriptions. Let's take a look. Hmm. So this is module goat dot subscriptions. And we're gonna import some of these other goaty things. But you don't see any keyboard, huh? Um no, I guess I don't, do I? Um Okay. And remind me again, what does this message parentheses dot dot mean? Is that just, what is that saying? That is saying um, expose all of the different messages from the uh, message type. So like start drawing, continue drawing, resize annotation, move annotation. Uh, so it's exposing all of those. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Directly. Mm-hmm. So you can, this is just exactly as defined in. Yeah. Otherwise I would have to say go dot update dot continue drawing. Right. Right. So. Okay, or at least update or something if you refer to it in a shorter way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so where are we getting our keyboard messages, if not here? Or, um, or is it here? So, yeah, everything in Elm is going to be explicit. So if you don't see import keyboard at the mm-hmm. top, it's definitely not here. So um, it's not really a subscription then? Mm-hmm. Well, it? if we see here, though, we see keyboard to message, right? Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, that's cool. I got a little distracted too and noticing um, an anonymous function down here. Mm-hmm. We haven't really looked at those today. Yeah. Um, That's but, actually another instance of the union type when someone clicks reset in like the Zendesk context, I don't care about a value coming in from JavaScript, so mm-hmm. I just ignore it and call reset. Oh, right. You're kind of saying this is like the same as the union type, but it is. just have the parentheses there. Correct. Interesting. Um, hmm. And and is that you're saying it's the same, but it's only the same because we know they're gonna pass us the unit type right there. Um, so they're just the, the slightest bit different between the underscore and the mm-hmm. unit type. The underscore is saying um, it's just a nice way of us saying like we don't care right. about this value. The unit type actually is a specific right. um, value. Like we could like I think we can do like equals equals on them. I'm not entirely sure on that. Right. I just don't play with them much. I anything that I don't care about, I just use an underscore to, to say I don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but we probably couldn't put the unit type here. Unless, again, unless we knew we we're gonna be getting the unit type there, like if if they were trying to give us actually a string, an int or string, we could still use the underscore, but not the unit type. Correct. That's the distinction. Okay. That was a good explanation. Thanks. Nice. Um. All right. So let's not get too distracted. My bad. Keyboard to message. Um. What am I looking at here? So we're in edit state config, which is a function that takes- is it a function. Oh, sorry, it's a type. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, just a, val- a value, yeah. <laughs> sorry, right? Sorry. I mean, you told me, I think, at one point um, that all... T- someone told me this. <laughs> so that all actually, types are fun. So I was actually wrong. I'm allowed to be wrong. And oh. uh, the zero argument functions, I mean, yeah, you can think of them as functions, but actually um, they are values um, because okay. it would be silly um, in like the, the compiled output of the JavaScript to have it be like a function, like you know, like an arrow function, and then just have a value sitting there. That'd be extra memory to yeah. like keep that fun- function mm. um, pointer around. Mm-hmm. So no, in, in Elm, if it has zero arguments, it's just a value. Okay. Okay. Uh, and this we wouldn't we wouldn't say this has arguments then because it uh, like this one does right. 
Yes, because there's that arrow. Okay, and then this function doesn't. All right, so this is... Wow. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But of course it makes sense if you look at what's on the right side, mm -hmm. right? Like, this is obviously a record, and this one is obviously just doing stuff. Like, it's actually a function. Mm -hmm. um, but in Elm, everything's just an expression anyway, right? Yep. It's like coffee script. <laughs> Rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, we love our coffee script. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, just for the record, I was a big Coffee Script fan. I think you've got other fans out there, too. So, yeah, no shame at all. It was good <laughs> stuff. It was good stuff. All right. Um, I know Richard himself. I think so. You know, yeah, I think he was one, of the, one of the horsemen of Elm here yeah. was a big Coffee Script advocate. Too. I think anything to push the, the web platform forward mm -hmm. is a good thing. Yeah. And I, I'll, I'll say for myself, certainly, I love being able to use everything as an expression yeah you know like in javascript if you do if else it's imperative construct it's just a language construct it's not actually evaluating to a value if you want to get something out of there you've you've got to do that one way or another by yourself manually like assign a value or return something or whatever it is yeah um but in coffee script as in um as in elm you it just evaluates to you know the value so yeah something definitely something which is nice <laughs> yeah it's fantastic yeah. All right, so here we are looking at just a type, um, and it's a, a record. Um, huh. But why don't we... Are we looking at that? No, are you sure this isn't a function? So... Because I don't see a type keyword. I don't see... So it's it's a value. So there's a it's difference. A value. So the equals always means that it's going to be a value. Oh, the so this kind of is a function. It's just been short-circuited to be a value by the time it's compiled. Is that a good way of thinking of it? I mean, in your mind right now, it's kind of like, oh, I want to give you a string, right? Because this could just be a string on the other side of that equal. And okay. it would just be a, like, a, you would consider that a value, right? Or a constant because well, it never Well, I guess, because then I might just refer to, like, then I might just get rid of all this stuff. Um, well, you couldn't just put a string on the page without a name to it. Yeah. Because then it would just, like, nothing. It would just... The compile, like if you yeah, we, well, I wouldn't want to use it. Yeah, yeah, well, it's not typed. Sure. Um, so it is just a value. Mm -hmm. It is just a record. Um, the reason you're even seeing this type here is simply because I'm saying this value is um, whatever config uh, with type messages. So this is, by the way, um, and I'm glad we got to it. Mm -hmm. The most complicated part of the app. Okay, um, I'm and, glad to hear you say that because I'm starting to get a little confused. Yeah, if there's if there's anything where it would be like, oh, this isn't very own beginner, it's this piece right here, but it's because it gives us a really nice abstraction. I kind of want to explain it if you don't mind. Or do yeah. you want to try to figure it out uh, let, while you're on? Yeah, let me see how far I can get. Sure. All right, so we are we have this value, edit state config, mm -hmm. and we have a type annotation which is saying um, it's an edit state dot config of message, I guess, is how, how I've been reading these. Sure. Do you want to so read far. the type itself? Um, I think it might help. Like if yeah, you went to it the... probably will. I'll try that. Um, so this is an edit state dot elm, and we have oops, config. So now we see our friend type alias config mm -hmm. equals, and then a, a record type, draw to message which is a function. Mm -hmm. Surprised to see. Not that surprised, I guess, but I am. It's different, right? It's different than you, anything you've seen yet. And yeah. it's very not common. Okay. So, okay. Draw to message and it takes a position and, and, and gives us a message. Mm -hmm. um, is this actually a function? This doesn't... This is a function, yeah. This is a function? Mm -hmm. Well, sorry. It's a... Uh, it's a type description of a function. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And then we have uh, resize the message, which has the same signature. Move to message, same signature. And then keyboard to message, which is very similar, but instead of taking a position, which kind of implies a mouse. Sorry. Yeah, mouse-based input. Mm -hmm. It is actually exposed right there. In court mouse oh, there the you page. go. Yeah. Uh, it is a keyboard message. Okay, so, hmm. okay, so edit state config. 
So what do you think why, of when why you... Why are we calling this config? Uh, so what are you thinking of this like record right now? Like you see a record with a bunch of functions inside of it, right? It's kind of weird. Yeah. It feels like maybe it's giving us some way to enforce that one of only a handful of functions could be called or applied in a certain situation, is my guess. It's kind of like giving names to a bunch of the functions that you can define for your app, right? Because lowercase message, if you remember, I'm not sure if anyone that's listening as well is familiar with type variables. Uh, the lowercase message there means it can be any app's messages. Mm. So like if I took this edit state module and gave it to someone who wasn't building goat, but was building like cat or fox, like they could have their own messages and they'd be able to reuse this um, config record because we're saying just as long as you give me a function that takes a position as an argument and returns your message, go with it. So that's that's what the mm -hmm. configuration is, is to give the consumer of this API some configuration options. I think I'm starting to get it. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, it's interesting. So we're going to need someone to give us this type of saying, hmm, it's saying it's a... Wow, this is confusing. So the type is um, a record, but we're going to need to give it a message. And and then every field in the record is going to be a function that takes one of these types as input and then always gives us the same type of message that we gave config earlier. Mm -hmm. I, I like to. I'd like to take the. It's a common confusion um, around these type variables mm -hmm. when when someone speaks of gave. Like mm -hmm. you said, we gave config yeah, a message, that's kind right? Of a fuzzy like thing. we're not we're not passing config a message. Okay. We're we're passing config a bunch of functions, right? Yeah. And those functions are going to return something, right? So yeah. every single of those functions have to has to return the same type of value. That's right. why they're all MSG MSG. They can't right. be A B C B E F G. Right. So they're all returning the same thing. Okay. And so um, the in our app, it's just going to be returning goat dot message mm -hmm. with capital M. So it just means that this config, just like there's a list of strings, this is going to be a config not of strings. It's going to be a config of messages. Okay. So I think of is a better way of describing it. If that makes right. some more sense to you. Yeah, config of message. I'm sure. And it, right, that's. Something I'm easing into in my own understanding is this. I didn't know about this config stuff until like I already wrote three versions of a library and then scrapped them all. <laughs> so nice. it's totally understandable. Is that, that the, like, reor the, dry, the reordable library? No, it was actually the, um, the uh, autocomplete. And that's where I uh -huh. had to actually sit with the language designer and him be like, hey, there's this thing you can do with nice. records. And it's really nice. It's, yeah. it's like it's an advanced concept, but it's, it's one that gives you a lot of power cool. um, to make reusable things. Nice. Um, hmm. Okay, so let's go back to, yeah? No, I think I think subscriptions is good. Let's see where we're using this. Yeah, exactly. I want to see where we're using this. So, okay. So, editor state dot config, edit state dot config, rather, we just looked at that. And here's, here's a, a capital M message, um, which, in our, which is what we're calling all of the messages in our app. Correct. But it could in theory, be any set of messages. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, this almost makes me think of instantiating, like we're making our own concrete <laughs> edit state config yeah. to bring in some concepts from completely other paradigms. You can, you can totally call it whatever, whatever helps you understand it too. Uh, <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing. We're just creating an actual configuration record. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, so we needed these four fields, you know, that we, we talked about already. The draw to message, resize to message, etc. Um, and and they need those need to be functions that um, give us a message. All the same kind of message, which is in our app we really only have one message. Yes, that's of true. Of course it's a union type, so we define a whole bunch of different specific messages it mm -hmm. could be. Yeah, just like continue drawing right there. Right, and so these look familiar to us from our our main um, um, model. Let's just call it Sorry. message. Sorry, message. Yeah. message. That's good. Where, where do we define those all? Uh, an update. 
an update. Sorry, right from our update file. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, I need to apologize. So, it's good. Yeah. good learnings. <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, I learned a lot today. <laughs> so now here we see uh, an operator that I don't think we've seen too much today, but. Um, let me see. oh if I hover over it it actually tells me what it does and so um, alright so this is kind of a little bit of a confusing thing but it takes two functions um, one that that takes uh, type A and returns type B another one that takes type A and returns type B and it gives us you mean B and C. He said the same ones twice, but I think I know what oh, you're saying. So sorry. B to C. B to C and, C and A, and a to B. Mm -hmm. And then it does it give us a function back as output? So uh, I think a better way to call this thing, just so we, because you'll read, immediately know it when you hear it, it's a compose function. Mm -hmm. So just like doing F of G of X or G of F of X. Right. It's just taking the output of one function and like giving it to another one. So it's just composing these two functions together. Um, is it not, um, is it no different than saying two drawing, two drawing position, resize annotation? Uh, no, it doesn't make sense. So, so yeah, it's like, it's as if, if you imagine, can I type something for a second? I think it would actually really bring this, um, yeah, it'd be a I small so. amount of typing. I just want to, I think this would be really good for viewers as mm -hmm. well to see. Um, this is the same thing as if we had like this. Like that's the position, right? Like the first argument. So this is an anonymous function. It would be the same as doing two drawing position and then uh, calling um, the result of that. Oops. So this is effectively the same thing. We are calling to drawing position, which takes in a position, it returns a new value, and then that goes into resize annotation. Which, when we say new value, what is that value? Uh, so it actually just, this is actually, this function all it's doing is like subtracting, I believe, like 81, the width of the control panel. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, just to map it to the drawing oh, okay, yeah, position. that makes sense, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so then we, what's the resize annotation doing for us? This is one of the messages, right? That mm -hmm. actually takes one argument, and that's the position. Okay. So, so they're both resize annotation. What's interesting about those message types, right, is that they're all just functions, just with names, right? Like resize annotation, and so it takes one argument, um, yeah. and that's the position. And so we're just piping the position through here. Uh, I'm not gonna use pipe. I'm gonna say we just compose those two functions together. Okay. Mm hmm. Hmm. It's totally fine if we leave this the way it will still work. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. But it's it's a little confusing to see. Okay. Well, because I see. So this thing gives us a function. That's what makes this special, really, right? I mean, because if we just did this, that would be, whoops. That would not be good. Yeah, what I, yeah, because we actually never have the value right. um, that we're calling on, right? Like this would mean um, continue drawing would try to call to drawing position, like, and then that would go at the end of here. It would continue drawing would be getting an extra mm. argument. I mean, we can always follow the error message because um has pretty nice error messages. Um, so yeah, it will say it looks like the function needs one more argument. Mm -hmm. Um, but it got, like, it didn't get enough. So, like, we'd be able to, you'd start to piece it together um, from the error messages is like, oh, I need I need something here. So the, the, the compose thing is just a nice shortcut. Um, and it reads nicely if you if you don't think necessarily about um, immediately what's happening, just reading move annotation um, after, like, when we get a drawing position. If you read it like that, it's nice compared to this way of, it's a little more, Mm. A little more code mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to read, but it is more explicit about what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because we we never actually got like we don't explicitly mention that pause argument, do we? No. Is there and so using that a little too much, by the way, I sometimes find to make code a little 
uh, hard to read. Yeah. That you can overuse it. Um, but sometimes okay. it's I really can believe that. It, it, sometimes it's a really nice um, a nice tool. And this, by the way, if if you want to go listen to talks, anyone listening to, uh, is called the point free style. Um, so that's an interesting like concept of functional programming where you can like describe all these transformations as composing different functions together. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's kind of cool. All right. So we're kind of uh, patching up a, a position and then sending that along to um, resize annotation. And, and the result of this expression is itself a function that would expect that position as input. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that should match exactly how we described resize an annotation um, in our update file is that it requires a position. Exactly. Okay, cool. Um, and then we, we did the similar things for, for the other fields there. But then, like, where do we use edit state in front? Yeah, we should check that out. And are we going to search for this or something? You can, or you can look around on the page. It's not a very big file. Oh, okay. Um, oh, so it must just be down here somewhere. Um, Oh, here it is. So image annotation subscriptions. Um, hmm. Takes a model and gives us a subscription. Yeah. Hmm. Um, all right. So we it looks like we, we you know we give it our model and then it checks to see if we have an image selected. Um, if so, then we want to call edit state dot subscriptions, which we haven't looked at yet. Um, passing it this edit state config record that we've we've created, and also the current edit state. Correct. Let's take a look at edit state dot subscriptions. Right, that sounds like the next thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we're back in edit state dot elm. And it takes a config type with message, with, um, which we just looked at, how we define that up, up here. Um, and then, you know, we kind of created, as I, as I called it, a concrete instance of it or whatever. Yeah, that's a good way. Concrete is a great way of describing it. And then, um, let's see, it also takes an edit state. Um, and then and then it gives us a subscription. So, um, but it's interesting. Like I'm, I'm going to be thinking about why is it called subscriptions? You know. Oh, because it's it's got the S, and you're thinking, expecting one. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's but listening. Are we batching to or something? We are we are batching right at the end. We just batch them together. Maybe the API is better to give you a list. I'm not sure yet. It's I'm only using it in one place, so <laughs> I'd, oh. I'd rather have some user testing. Oh, I haven't released yeah. it as like a library or anything. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you, you said batch them right at the end because like we do it at the beginning in terms of line numbers. Yeah. But what this operator doing is doing is it's gonna take the results of all this right. Yeah. And then and then pass it in here as an. Because every even the case inspection returns right. So. Yeah. Like okay. And uh, I don't use that often. Um, it's just usually nice for like one liners like oh I want to batch them all together. It can yeah. be it can be a nice tool. Okay. Um, and so since we're dealing, well, again, we have that telltale sign of, um, you're probably looking at a, a union type. So we've got our edit state, which, have we looked at edit state, what that is? Uh, a little bit. Um, it was the state machine that we, um, talked about, uh, in that. Diagram. Oh, right. Yeah. The big, uh, flow chart state machine. Mm -hmm. Um, Right, and if so, of course, that's a union type then, because any any state machine needs to have one state <laughs> at yeah, any time. At any time, yeah. Um, and so what we're going to subscribe to depends on our edit state, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so if we're drawing, then, yeah, we're going to want to listen to mouse moves um, or subscribe to them more. Mm -hmm. And we're going to want to hmm, sub dot map. We're gonna subscribe to, I guess, a whole bunch of keyboard subscriptions. So there's particular there are particular keys you're gonna be listening to, right? Mm -hmm. And then for resizing, very similar. We we need to know 
um, uh, when the mouse is moving. But something we we didn't we just kind of jumped over right now is that we're sending mouse dot moves a function yep. to call when the mouse moves, mm -hmm. and that function is coming straight from this config record that we created, and and so of course. Like now it makes a lot of sense to think about the fact that this uh, this function is guaranteed to return a message. Yes. And not just any message, but like the our same, special message yeah. that our app uses all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of cool, actually, because this is what this is doing in my head is like it's like breaking out of our land and like sending it up to like the Elm runtime mm -hmm. or some abstraction over that. Uh, if I don't know. That's what I'm thinking about, like, without getting too less of the details there. Sure. And telling it, oh, and, uh, you know, here's a callback that you can, um, or maybe not even a callback, but, like, here's a function that we want you to, 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 to call um, whenever the mouse moves. And in our case, it we're tying it right back into the messages that we're going to use to update our model. Yeah. So I like to think of it as, um, you say callback, which is a very JavaScript thing. Um, right. And I like to think about it in this one as, uh, I kind of like to think of it in this case specifically, as like tagging. Like we're just, if for our app, we're calling this mouse move, we're going to call it draw, like um, drawing, uh, continue drawing, I think is what we call it in the actual record if we go back to um, subscriptions. And then it's like in resizing, we want to call these mouse moves, we want to call those resizes. And in mm -hmm. moving, we want to mm -hmm. call them uh, re, uh, move annotation. So we can actually, okay. do you want to go see this in the app with that debug um, window pop-up? Sure, yeah, that that's, sounds it, fun. It's okay, going to be yeah. useful. Okay, great. So let's go back to Goat and uh, I click Explore History and oh, look at us. We have no states. No states. So far, wow. So um, I'm just kind of sad we just lost that window. And I arrange it so we don't really lose it. Um, actually, maybe we should get rid of the yeah, we don't inspector need that and just put it under here, yeah? Sure. All right. So we're going to pick a goat. And let's let's draw, right? Yeah. So I'm going to click the... Let's do a simple shape. So I'm going to click the round rack tool. Um, and you can see already that uh, it waited to see if I was going to long press. And I did not. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm actually thinking more and more that this is actually a great way to intro large apps to people too is mm -hmm. um, so just them. showing the debug yeah. uh, panel. I think it right. tells a lot. And these these are messages, right? These yeah. are all the messages that we've defined for goat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go Like back show here. me the goats. <laughs> show me the goats. And um, let's draw a round act. So, wow. So lots of updates here, lots of messages. Um, as we talked about, we need to have them. Otherwise, we wouldn't see the rectangle growing as I drag the, the mouse across the screen. The screen. Um, so, wow. Um, we can time travel, <laughs> and we can also time travel to this if we want to see. Right. Um, so let's just, we'll go right back to the very beginning then, shall we? So, um, you know, I, I um, selected the shape I wanted to draw, and then the first message that we saw after that was was start drawing. Um, so start drawing is a message, mm -hmm. and so so I guess the debugger is showing us you know a list of messages, and of course it shows us the resulting state after that message has been updated, right? Correct. Like it's been processed. Do you want to flip between these uh, these two? The start drawing and cancel. Um, drop down wait. Okay. Oh yeah, see what changed, I when guess. It starts, yeah. So what changed was we went from edit state not selecting to a more complicated edit state. Now we're drawing. Oops. And it's interesting because what I don't see here is what we're drawing. But that's um but but that's a different state. Sorry, different field of the state uh, of the model <clears throat> drawing. So we know we're drawing a rounded rect. So that's kind of interesting. So it kind of has to be pieced together from here. But it's all just one big state, one big model. So, mm -hmm. so we're seeing um, we're drawing and that has um, a record is what's shown here. Um, this would be the short, the short version and the long version shows us the fields. 
So of course we've got a current position and positions, um, which right now is a list of past positions, I guess, which is zero. I mean, a li a, a, an empty list. Mm -hmm. And then we have start position, which is the same because we're just starting to draw right now. So it's like mouse down. And of course we got like a whole absolute ton of, of um, updates here. I'm just gonna go through and oh wow, it's cool. You can see the shape being, being drawn as I go down. It doesn't look like it's auto scroll. I'm not sure of the current state as I kind of lost it. Yeah. Um, but eventually we're gonna finish trying. So I'll just scroll down until I can see that. And then I'm just gonna keep hitting the arrow key. <laughs> there are a lot, ladies might and just gents. Click it, but... <laughs> Okay. Well, you get the idea. <laughs> so, and here we go. So here's the last one. And the next one is close drop down. Okay. Because what's happening here, just kind of taking a look back at what I saw earlier and um, and kind of combination of that plus guessing. But, um, you know, when we processed, I guess, a message, you can, you know, you can issue more than one other message or call another more than one other function. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what happened here, but when we finished drawing, I guess we got a, um, a would, would, the, would there be a command coming in? No, no. So there'd be a, from a subscription. We get everything's gonna be coming in because what it comes in. Yeah, everything comes in as a message. Mm -hmm. Right. Great. So um, right. So of course we were subscribed to the mouse mouse drawing. And we got uh, got a message here that said. I guess close drop down. Sometimes so we gave it a function. So, sometimes function. we get messages that like um, like maybe I didn't intend like I didn't I had I left a mouse like I left an event handler on something in a certain state that I didn't need to and if nothing broke I don't need to clean up that message. Yeah, okay. But like when you use this it becomes obvious. Oh, I'm sending extra messages. Yeah, like no the drop down was already closed. Yeah. Like, like so, if you so go back to these states, there is no open drop. Yeah, and so it wouldn't do anything, right? And that's that's great. Right, and that's fine. Yeah. So, but it might be something of course, I the clean important up. thing is that we finished drawing, and, and if you look here, there's a big difference in that the edit state goes from this drawing object, which had the current position and the, and the start position, and then we just finish. And so now it's not selecting, which is that um, the state that we used to call um, red, ready, ready to draw. What was it? Used to, we used we to used call, call it, ready to draw. Ready no, to draw. Not selecting. Ready to, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I don't know. I kind of. They're that, both they're both fine. I kind of like the old name in a way, mm. where it's just like your chill state. It's like nothing's going on. Yep. <laughs> Maybe ready to draw is a better name. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, because it's you know you're not drawing, you're not selecting, you're just. Should we take down. a vote? <laughs> <laughs> With the two of us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> so no. <laughs> yeah. Um. No. Uh, I know. Just thinking here, trying trying to look what's going on. So. So that makes sense. Um, so after finished drawing, right, like, but now um, drawing is the same, but mm -hmm. edit state is now changed. Where do you think that mm -hmm. the information went um, once? Right, well, we, we probably created an annotation. <clears throat> so let's look for those. Hmm. Um, I, I, I don't see it. Oh, um, so I believe if we look back at the types, it might be a little more clear, but um, mm -hmm. I call this the edits field. Okay. And that's because it's actually not just an array of annotations, but mm -hmm. an undo list mm -hmm. of an array mm -hmm. of annotations so that wow. it tracks the changes to this array. Right. So um, you, we added to the, um, uh, I believe, the present, um, mm -hmm. which is an array. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, so that's really interesting. And... Not not only is it interesting, <laughs> it's very interesting, <laughs> um, because one thing that we're gonna try and avoid is, um, again, impossible things, impossible states. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking of edits like it's what powers undo, and it is, mm -hmm. but it's more than that. It's like the list of everything we currently have drawn. It's like it's our it's our annotations list. I was expecting it to be like a list of annotations. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't per se it's just part of this model that we've constructed with edits mm -hmm. and um, and I like that because you know if you now implicitly when you're editing rather when you're updating this um, edits field of our model 
you are implicitly changing the current annotations. Not even implicitly, you're explicitly doing that. Mm -hmm. At the same time. Yeah. Um, with the same... You're forced, to, the same, you're forced to handle it, right? Not yeah. only you're forced to handle it, it's... Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. Is you're forced to handle it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to f try to remember to go change another part of my model. Mm -hmm. I change the one part that matters, and yeah. it does both at once. It used to be, interesting historical fact, the entire model mm -hmm. I used to... Um, put in an undo list because mm -hmm. there were some nice helpers from that library that okay. enabled me to make everything undoable. But what I came soon to realize was I didn't care about the button selection and the undo state. I didn't care about, you know, many of the things that were mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I ended up doing a lot was I made a little helper function that said, skip the change. So there was a way to right. use the undo list to say like, oh, just map the present, like only change the present field. Um, but then eventually I realized after some refactoring that, you know, it just needs to be the array of annotations. It's the only thing that actually changes mm -hmm. that I care about undoing. Yeah. So. I guess, I mean, looking at the, the rest of the model here, there are things that we probably wouldn't want to undo. For example, the clipboard. Like, generally speaking, if you copy an object and then undo, 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 and then paste, you would expect the most recent thing that you copied to be pasted, mm -hmm. not whatever you copied back at that point in the past. It'd be yeah. an interesting experience. Well, no, yeah, I'm like telling so. you right now, I know that's not how applications work. No, you're totally right. It just sounds like a fun thing to see. Yeah, <laughs> and and you wouldn't be crazy for suggesting that either. And I know there are some um, advocates of being able to undo everything that you do on the computer, like just period. Like you should always mm -hmm. be able to just go back. Interesting. For anything. Wow. Um, I think that'd be noisy. Yeah, I and mean, it's one of those things where it's like no one's really built that computer that people would use for normal things. Also, by the way, that is very memory intensive. I'm just sure it would be, that yeah. Up. So I yeah, would well, definitely not be into that. <laughs> there you go. So, but you know, like I said, I've heard it advocated. So, um, someone, someone will probably tell us a, a memory big name. or a memory efficient way way to do it. <laughs> that, or I was, I was thinking someone will tell me who I'm thinking of who said that. Hmm. Um, it's one of these big names in computer science. Yeah. All right. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, what else should we do now? Um, uh, I did want to ma make a note if you go back okay, to the yeah. edits field. Um, mm -hmm. I expanded a little bit here to show that um, this structure is really gross, by the way, because this is using um, an array library that's not from the core, but it's um, you know being proposed as like possible addition to the core. Okay. Um, and that's why it's because it has a special structure. And mm -hmm. every all the structures, the data structures, get exposed to us in this debugger. So like, yeah. you know, like I, nothing in my app knows about what the edit state states are. If you remember that a little bit, like I said, I hid those that union type. I never exposed it anywhere in the code. Well, it's showing up here. So mm. we know about it for debugging purposes because um, right. it gets like too stringed and stuff. Um, but right in here, like this array, yeah, it's like obviously some kind of tree or something. Um, so it has like this weird structure to us. But uh, you can see in this... Yeah, I mean, when, we, when I hear array and tree, those are very different things. Yeah, well, like the backing model for an mm -hmm. immutable array and data structure yeah. in Elm, you know, it might have some interesting exotic data structures, right? So okay. I'm not even entirely sure. There was a big paper on the, like, dev mailing list and stuff. I never really paid too much attention. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the only uh, point that I think is worth noting here is right now, there's only two things in the array. There's two, uh, when I say things, I mean annotations here. And uh, we can see that they're in the correct order and mm -hmm. they'll have all the correct values and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, just something to note that like that's where you can it's go for true. that source of truth. That pink color is definitely a correct value. Mm -hmm. People like that color. Nice. Um, yeah, single source of truth. I mean, shapes round up nothing. So that's, I don't know, what is the nothing? You probably know off the top of your head, don't you? Sure. So, um, I was trying to reuse as much as I could in these types um, around a concept of shape, which is this record right here. Every shape has, uh, sorry, a start, an end, a stroke color, and a stroke style. That's true of every single thing in, in the left hang uh, control panel here. But I wanted to be, so I wanted to be able to write helper functions for these shapes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to get different things, different um, view functions to respond appropriately, I also added a field of type like, rounded rect, this is like this first argument could be rounded rect, or it could be rect, or it could be um, ellipse, mm -hmm. or it could be line, or mm -hmm. not line, just the, those different ones. Right. And then this one, nothing, that's mm -hmm. because of the fill. 
That's the fill. That's okay. the fill. And so I made it impossible to yeah. represent a fill outside of these these shapes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, oh, with, the, yeah. with this shape's tag. Mm -hmm. So when it goes to spotlights, there is no such thing as a fill. Right. So, because that was a bug I encountered very early on. Was yeah, I remember we're able, that. We're able to add fills to spotlights. Right. Again, so like, just to demo the spotlight again, here's your spotlight. Oh, you're going to hit resume. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I got to hit resume. So, here's this. No, okay. I, no, just I, because yeah, I did it while I wasn't resumed. Okay. Yeah. So here's a spotlight. And again, if we filled that in, then there's no point. We're highlighting a solid <laughs> color. It's dumb. Yeah, it's dumb. I mean, right? I mean, we can simulate that just by getting a solid color and then drawing on top of it. You know, like, why would you do that? It's, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, maybe you, maybe you want to. Yeah. No, I don't it really could be like that. the next Kanye cover you, you album. Cannot, <laughs> you can already just do, do it something with these that's tools. like garbage design and then put Kanye's name on it so everyone's like wow that is it that's the new thing it's the new thing here you go Kanye well this one has Alan's name on it <laughs> that's I mean I said it's not the new thing until Kanye puts his name okay. on it okay we'll get his permission yeah um, so does that make more sense this flow of uh, we are using a drawing to know what we're drawing we have this state that changes um, with these subscriptions mm -hmm. coming in of uh, the mouse moves right, right. Uh, we cover that and we see this changing and then at the end, it just goes back to like not selecting, and right. it gets added to this array, this right. undo list of an array. Right. Um, so yeah, cool. that's like pretty much the core of how everything works. In yeah. The app. Um, let's um, now that we have the debugger open, let's go ahead and undo. I want to see what happens if we undo. Sure. Here. So, okay. So let's uh, take it back from. Uh, go ahead to go hit resume again. Oh, so. sorry. I have to hit resume. Okay, so we finished drawing at five four four is the last thing. Undo. And so, you know, the message came in undo, and this is interesting because I'm gonna hit resume already. No, yeah, because this is showing me the latest state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's just back to like you know not selecting. But um, what do you think would have changed? Well, that? yeah, I mean, we would have we deleted a, an annotation in here. We deleted mm -hmm. a shape. Like so, so now the the top shape is spotlight. But if I hit you do, you'll see that the top shape is actually the round rect that I mm -hmm. drew with a fill right here. So instead yeah. of nothing, it has um, just a fill. It's like red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I don't really like. Even though this is definitely the better cover album. Mm -hmm. Just got the suggestion of furry hooks. Could have been. It's furry very hooks. suggestive, yeah. I yeah. Agree. Yeah. Um, well, friends, it's getting it's getting late here, but I think there was maybe there might be a couple things we wanted to take a look at before we call it a night. What do you think, Greg? Yeah, I think um, we've really seen pretty much the process of how annotations are added, mm -hmm. how they're um, undone. Um, we've seen how fills are selected. We've seen a little bit of this state machine. Um, I think the last bit of the state machine that's pretty interesting and. I'm still debating as an API currently, is yeah. when it comes to seeing how this actually becomes a view. How does this become an SVG? Right. So I think it'd be interesting if we dove into like the drawing area's SVG code. Right, and I know you wanted to take a look at an arrow probably, right? Uh, sure, why that's not? a good example. So here's an arrow. Wow, I thought it would be purple, but that's because there's no fill. We use line color for these. Mm -hmm. So that's my bad. Uh, so here's here's purple. And you can you can see it kind of has this, this kind of stretchy feel to it, almost rubber band. Oh, wait, did we ever demo that if you hold shift, things happen? <laughs> oh, no, we totally didn't do that. So if you hold shift, then it constrains the drawing to 45 degree angles or whatever fraction of pi that is. It's been a while for me. Uh, I forget pi over... <laughs> pi four? Pi over four, yeah. Uh, maybe? And you're correct. Because okay. pi is uh, 180 degrees. Right. There you go. 180 degrees of pi. It sounds like a good... Birthday dessert to me. Very yummy. Also, bad, bad name. Okay. Um, so, so what happens? Let's, let's, uh, let's draw another, draw another, um, arrow, right? So, so here's my drawing of an arrow. And, um, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of intermediate continued drawing states. Oh, look at this. Keyboard message down. So that's when I shift. That's when I was constraining back there. That's mm -hmm. kind of cool. Um, but that was the last arrow. So here's start drawing an arrow, and you can see it has a very weird shape. Very, very sharp Because shape. it's really just a point. It's like when we tried to draw an arrow as a point. Mm. So um, we, can, we can do some nicer things around that where the user never sees that. Yeah. For sure. Definitely. 
Um, One thing I'd like to note, Alan, is if you scroll mm -hmm. up a little bit um, okay. in, the, in the messages, you mm -hmm. see this resize annotation? Yeah. If we jump back to the code real quick, okay. um, like, do you remember how we had all that configuration going into here? Um, this is the, these are the different messages that we put into that configuration record of um, either want to continue the drawing or we want to resize annotation. Mm -hmm. So these were all mouse movements. I could have had those right. all come in as the same thing as, um, I'm sorry, uh, like, you know, just, just uh, like mouse, mouse, mouse moved. Mouse and then, moved. And then, but that's, and then, yeah. That makes a nasty debug experience. Okay. And also it means I have to do some kind right. of case switching with the API in there. So wow. I move that into the API itself. So right. I have this nice little subscriptions function. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. I can definitely see the value of seeing those um, those um, messages come in with their specific intention mm -hmm. instead of just being the, the result of a very naive subscription. Yeah, it helped me a lot when I was uh, building it. So Cool. Good to know. Um, anyway, we're, we're, we're not, you know, we're not live. But... Um, all right, so start drawing, and we did a whole bunch of drawing. Eventually, we decided it's good. I let up on the mouse. We finished drawing. So I guess one thing we could take a look at a little bit is the view around this, right? Yeah. Um, oops, clicking the clock. Don't click the clock. Okay. So view is the whole big thing, and we, we looked at some of these comments earlier. So we can probably drill down view, to something view. that's important for right. us. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and click on view, and then we have... Well, drawing area. Oh, annotation. That sounds promising. Let's try it. Let's take a look. Wow, lots of imports. Okay. Now, one thing I want to note real quick when you see this, mm -hmm. that's like, whoa, that's yeah. a lot of imports. And, right. that, and that, to me, uh, signals that this needs to be broken up further. Okay. And also that like things should be grouped in a more modular way. So, What does like, that mean, a more modular way? Um, so by that is, there was actually a really excellent post on um, the subreddit for Elm, like I think just yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um where uh, Evan Chaplicki actually explained what he meant by modular. Um, and it was very, very interesting. It was something that I heard a little earlier, but it's something. It's a way that we've been thinking very differently. In JavaScript, we think around these components that have this state, and then we ask them for it with getters and setters to right, a degree. Right. Um, and we give callbacks and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, in the Elm approach, it seems uh, that we start putting a bunch of helper functions that know how to work with a particular data. Okay. So you have that we had that edit state module, right? That was my first attempt at this in this project. All those functions, subscription, um, change drawing, finish, they were all related to edit state. Right. Uh, very intrinsically so. Yeah. And we never exposed the internals of edit state. Evan's, right. Evan's best example of this that I just want to quickly note was the dictionary library. Mm -hmm. If you use the dictionary, you don't know that underlying it's um, a tree. Right. You, you never can ask for a node and get and set a node. You can just get and set by ID. You just, that's the interface. Yeah, that's the, the, the API mm -hmm. and the interface, right? And so we have to be careful when we design these systems to not have what you're seeing here of all these imports because we didn't isolate what is related. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is this is a definite, this is a module I really want to refactor. So it, it'll be good for you to see some code that I'm not super, super proud of. Cool. So. Wow. Well, one thing catches my eye here, which is that we have json.decode imported. Um, something that I haven't experimented or seen really myself, but I've heard a whole lot about is um, importing and exporting JSON mm -hmm. from Elm, which kind of has this reputation of being like one of the less pleasant things to do maybe in Elm. Just yeah. with, and it makes sense because you're, you're moving from a super strongly typed and, and structured world in mm -hmm. terms of data to one that's like famously like complex. down with whatever. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's down with whatever. <laughs> right? So, you know, I mean, it's no XML, but it's, uh, yeah. you know, very simple, but extremely flexible. Sure. Whereas XML, I mean, you know, no, I don't think people really like writing X, XML or inter interacting with XML, but one thing it has going for it is it's very enforceable. You can have a very strict, you know, um, validation checker of your HTML. I'm sorry, sure. XML is what I meant to say. Sure. So, so I'm kind of curious. I know we should probably go find that arrow code that we're going to look at, but like, how are we using so JSON can, in here? Uh, is that okay? Can we so, take so high level before we even see it. Um, we're we're never uh, in in this app. We're never like asking things from a server, right? So we're never right. like hitting API and decoding that JSON response. Right. This is all. Um, and by the way, decode just means for anyone familiar, just to take 
um, some JavaScript object. Um, That's a string. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's JSON. And then like, oh, I guess sorry. it's just, mm -hmm. but the, the point is to, to take that object okay. and to turn it into an Elm type. Okay. So um, yeah, like into an Elm. Well, that's what this means in the context of the JSON Elm module. Yes. All right. So and okay. there's many helper modules, but the, the 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 what it's used for here is literally just oh I have like an event like a mouse event and I want to grab certain things out of the mouse event so you can get like you know the position of the mouse. Oh, that's it. Um, and I think we grab I think I grab a couple other things like maybe like the width or something. So I'm not where sure. are we we'll using see. it? Um, we could search for it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm just gonna search for. Uh, look for just JSON with capital J. Actually. Well, there's only because well, no, I import it as JSON. Oh, uh, I guess I kind of read that backwards in my head. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, interesting. That you just call it JSON. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Because I never do the encode. Interesting. Do I hmm. only use it in one place? Hmm. I think I used to use it a lot more. Um, no, oh, here we go. More places. Cool. A lot of JSON.maps. There we go. So JSON.decode.map. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll ignore that one because that was where I was yeah. saying it might be a hack. I don't even need it anymore. Okay. Um, so this one, there's definitely a lot going on. Is this? this? Oh, okay. So that's annotation attributes when not selecting. Mm -hmm. um, For some. Which is a function. Yeah. <clears throat> so real quick to give this thing context before we head into the JSON, if you scrub just a tiny hair, the function right above it, Edit state, state attributes. attributes. Yeah, so this is the last part of the API that I was um, building for edit state. So I want you to just kind of uh, give me what your first thoughts of or what, what you think this thing is doing. Yeah. Okay, so it's a function that takes an integer index and then also an edit state, which is um, you know something we looked at earlier, um, and returns a list of SVG attribute messages or SVG attributes of message, I guess. Yeah. And this is interesting. So we start with an empty list, and then we, we're calling this piping it, I guess. We're piping yeah. it into um, all these functions as the last argument. Mm -hmm. So we call edit state dot when not selecting, and... Um, well, let's look at this type annotation. Um, it's kind of hard to read there, but it says um, it takes a, a just a generic type variable, I guess. Mm -hmm. Any value. <clears throat> Any value. And edit state. Mm -hmm. And then why does it say arrow A, arrow A? Because it takes another any value and then returns that any value, but they all all the a's have to of be the same. same. Type. Mm -hmm. Well, not the same, but the same type, right? Uh, same type. Right. Yes, all the a's are the same. Okay, right. Yeah, not the same value, just the same type. So, sure. right, and then okay, that's interesting. That's like a weird kind of a yeah. signature where you're taking in an edit state and two of the same type and returning that same type. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'm we're also, talking about go ahead. I was just gonna say I'm also like this isn't necessarily a final API. Um it's more of I want to get an idea of like what do you think um without necessarily thinking of the individual functions here like when not selecting, when mm -hmm. drawing, when selecting, what do you think that this like this piping, this whole operation, what do you think it's doing? What what, what is this function giving us in return? Do you have any idea at this point? Or is that orthodox string? It's weird. Um, I don't know. It's hard to understand because, oh, uh, well, the fact that they all start with when and also the fact that I probably wouldn't be in all these states at the same time. Mm -hmm. And also there are six of them, <laughs> which is how many states our Currently. finite state machine has, mm -hmm. um, makes me think that it's pretty much a way of saying, hey, whichever one of these states you're in, go ahead and do something. That's exactly what it's doing. Yeah. Um, and so this is a, an interesting, you know, we could do this with a case switch, right? Right. That's how we typically seem to handle it. Exactly. Um, and so the benefits of that approach are that you handle all the cases, right? Like, right. You're, you'll have mm -hmm. a compiler if you forget one. Exactly. Um, but so the reason that I made the API to say like, well, what if we just use some top level functions mm -hmm. is well, like in some cases, you're gonna see these, this, these, this API used again, 
where I just don't care about all the states. Oh, like for, like for vertices, I don't care except for like two cases. And for another thing, like for some other things, I only care when it's like moving or resizing. Or maybe I only care when it's selected or editing text. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of places where I only care about some. Mm -hmm. And because it's all presentational, um, these aren't like updates. Yeah. Because none of okay. these, as you know, but if I if I expose that right. case you switch, you, you would be allowed to change those things yourself, which mm -hmm. is, that breaks the whole point of the finite state machines. If I could change, if I knew all the values of the finite state machine, mm -hmm. I could just go in and change them. Mm -hmm. And then that means I could go from like drawing to... Um, I don't know, resizing, right? And that would be a bad, bad time, like directly. Um, like, yeah, like, I, you're going to understand why you wouldn't want to expose all the internals of a finite state mm -hmm. machine. Um, so that you're doing this to avoid exposing internals of the finite state machine? So I have two choices. For, so I, to, not, to not expose it, I could either expose another union type mm -hmm. where I have all the same things, but just, yeah. you know, the public API version mm -hmm. of it. Or I could expose this. And I've been playing with this idea as... Um, like the reason I'm liking the pipes is I just often don't care about all the cases and the underscore case, it doesn't really like help me at saying anything else. It's like, well, in this case, I just, I already handled my anything else. It was the empty list. These are the, the defaults to run. Um, in okay. The case of anything oh, else. so these are all commands. Are these commands that were? Sorry, when you say commands. Uh, no, these are, these are all just, um, this is all building up a list of right. attributes. Oh, attributes. So like these events Yeah. and any kind of like class, like this is giving us, Different cursors, mm -hmm. like when we're on top on top of a drawing, we have a crosshair, and when we're on top of a selecting thing, we have a move, move cursor and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting though because I, I don't understand this. Like, this is just returning a list of, well, in this case, one attribute. Mm -hmm. Um. But we never gave it like a set of attributes to append to or anything like that. So uh, I guess it doesn't. I'm not sure how this would be used exactly. Um, yeah. So like, let's say we wanted all these to append together instead of piping. See that pipe operator? We could do a plus plus, and that would append uh -huh. to the list. So I wanted these to be. Um, in this case, I wanted them to be ors. They're exclusive. They're all exclusive. But you could easily change it to be all inclusive, like they could all add together. Um, but well, at least the default could add to it. So I don't know. I'm still debating this uh, transformation. It is a bit weird, um, but I also like the couple places it gets used. So maybe if you like search around for it a little bit, um, you'll see a couple of different use cases. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, so these are the this is the list of attributes that get passed to all annotations. Um, that. What is the list? I don't see a list. So these lists, I'm sorry. The annotation attributes when not the, selecting. These guys right here? Mm hmm So the, that gets passed. Oh, you mean like this guy and then this guy and then the next one? All these. All these. Whenever it's the correct state, yes. Yeah. So those get passed. Uh, which to... are the things? Are these, the, these are, yeah, yes. being fired up here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. So one more time. These are what? This is a list of. So there's just a list. That in the end returns a list of attributes. And an attribute is mm -hmm. anything that would go on the... Um, attributes in the SVG. So like not the ch children, but just like class names, um, events, everything, all of those things are attributes, by the way. Yeah. So here's what I don't see, Greg, is we start with a list, right? Sure. And and we're piping it in. So now we're passing to when not select. Oh, no, I just made sense. Okay. So I was thinking we pass this list to this, and then we pass, a, like, all these get a list. Every one of these gets a list. Yep. Um, except down here, I'm not seeing a list as input, only as something that's returned. Yeah. But then what I realized is, okay, this function isn't that. This is. Mm -hmm. So yeah. giving it the index will return, well, like, this should eventually return a list. It has to return a list. We just saw that right here. We don't yeah. need to hover it over gets it. There's no partial evaluation for that one. It just immediately yeah. Yeah, it goes. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because the when not selecting, if you hovered over it before, you were like, oh, look, it didn't even take any arguments. It just wanted a value. But this one gave you some drawing info. So that's where this underscore is. Mm -hmm. um, for the, I just don't care about the drawing info in this case. Okay. So. Right. Hmm. So well, we were curious about the JSON. So what's going on here with the JSON? Um, your your JSON mapping. Whoa! <laughs> I'm gonna try and side scroll here. Okay. 
JSON.map, you're calling on these two values. So we're giving it the result of this thing, which I'm just going to ignore for a second, yeah. and also a mouse position. So I'd read from right to left on this one, actually. Um, okay, sure. We're, we would expect a function. Mm -hmm. Cool. And we should, that should make sense. Like, I, I kind of just saw the parentheses and, like, ignored everything in the middle. Yeah. But if we look at don't it. ignore everything in the middle for a second, we see our friend, well, I forget, we, there was a name for this guy. Compose. The Compose operator. And we know, one thing we know about the Compose operator, <laughs> I almost feel like it's the only thing I know is that it operates on functions and it returns a function. Like, it just always returns a function. Mm -hmm. And so that means I just know this is a function. Like, this is a function. Um, so going back to the signature, it takes a function and also, wow, um, a JSON decode decoder. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> uh, and returns a JSON, oh, of A. Yes. And then also returns JSON decode decoder value. So mm -hmm. it can be a different type. Um, but the, the types correspond to the input and output types of the function. So whatever the heck this eventually creates, it better take in one type and return another type. Mm -hmm. And um, okay, well, this is uh, this is complicated again. Yeah. So so map map is a concept. So you're familiar probably with like I'm definitely familiar with map. Yeah, but so you're familiar with it usually in the in case general. of lists, but you're also familiar with it in the case of like modules. I don't know. So what that's is a module map. So that that's that's why I wanted to, to bring up that I thought I only learned when I started doing Elm. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I always thought of map as, oh, I'm gonna do something to all the things in a list. Right. Well, what map really means is I'm gonna do something to this type. So the list is a type, right? So when you think of it in your head of, I'm gonna change all the things in a list, mm -hmm. like well, the list knows about many things, right? Mm -hmm. So you're saying I'm gonna do all the things that, that type knows okay. about. So in this case, we're saying, we don't know what a decoder is, okay? We just imagine we just have no idea. Sure. But it's in that module. I don't have to JSON. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Um, and so when we call map, we're saying, okay, take whatever uh -huh. value that decoder has. It could be a string, and we're going to turn it into an integer. So it's going to be uh, the same. It's going to stay the, the type, json.decode, uh, and it'll result as json.decode. But the type inside of it will change. Wow, Okay. Okay, and that, that definitely sounds like a map kind of thing to do. Yeah. Like if you ran map on a list of floats and rounded them all, you'd end up with a list of ints. Mm -hmm. And if you like had a maybe, like something's there, maybe something's not, if you run map on that, maybe it's a maybe of an integer. Mm -hmm. If I said maybe dot map times two, it would only multiply two if mm -hmm. there was just something. Okay. If there was nothing, it would just leave it as nothing. And that's wow. why map is useful. Okay, so... So just trying to be intuitive about this and, and reading mm -hmm. it. So this would, you know, not thinking it in terms of what would I be able to write this line of code, which I feel like I'd really have to work up to. But in terms of reading it, we were getting a mouse position, or we're not getting it, but we... We are, actually. You got it right. Oh, we are? Yeah. So if you go click on, maybe there'll be a tool tip there um, um, for the mouse sorry, position. Sorry, side scrolling is a little touchy. Sure. So yeah, if you just click on it, maybe we'll get it. Right. Yeah. So it's a decoder of mouse dot position, mm -hmm. which we knew had to be a decoder of something. <laughs> yeah. And so this is actually taking like the event um, object, like we get in JavaScript when we say like on click and mm -hmm. then we get that E. It's just doing E dot um, like whatever the mm -hmm. X and Y, like, mm -hmm. and it's just putting them together into a record. Mm -hmm. That's just a nice shortcut provided by okay. the mouse module. Okay. So and that creates that's the decoder then, it knows it knows it's just it's just a description of what I'm gonna do to that object when I get it. Yeah, that's why I think of it as decoders like yeah. a description. Okay. And then we have two drawing position, which I remember this one. This was the thing that just um cal like it removed the offset of our controls. Correct. So that kind of makes sense. Um, that we we're trying to bring us back to a zero that we can work with. Mm -hmm. close this for us and then um, annotation index is just the index that we've got um, here 
And then select and move annotation. Let's take a look at this type signature. No. May have to command click to it. Hmm. That works. That doesn't want to work. Oh well. I hate when things don't work. Oh wait, well no, that's the wrong thing. Okay. Well, it takes well, one more argument, and it's like the, yeah. the two. Well, we already function. know what it has to be, sort of, don't we? Yeah. Because we let's go back to JSON.map. I mean, we we saw that we had a JSON decoder decoder of of something over here. It was of mouse dot position. So that'd be A, right? And then we have oh, that's A, not the. Oh, right, because of this little guy, which is tricky, and he he, he takes some... Um, you can kind of ignore two drawing position and that. Like, let's just ignore that for a second. What if what mm -hmm. if two drawing position and the compose weren't there? What mm -hmm. if it was just JSON on that map, select yeah. a move annotation? So, like, if we deleted the control panel, then yeah. we, we could just get rid of this. Yeah, and so if you imagine that wasn't there, yeah. now maybe try to read it, because it's a little tougher to read with the compose. Yeah, right so in that case, it would... Correct me if I'm wrong, it would just be select and move, mouse annotation, and then the arguments would be annotation index and mouse dot position. Correct. Cool. That definitely does kind of make it easy. Yeah. That's kind of neat. Like, like yeah, sometimes, like, again, the syntax is very new to me coming from, you know, kind of, gosh, like, I, almost every language I've ever worked in my whole life is some variant of C, essentially. Like, it's just Absolutely. parentheses after a function name and then jam things in between commas, like whether it's Python or Ruby or JavaScript or, or um, you know, even CoffeeScript. It's like, oh, sometimes I can omit parentheses, but at the end of the day, it's the same. Yeah. So this is still new. To it me. is totally new. It's this to this is my about. first language I've ever had where yeah. it wasn't C, and I was pretty, it was jarring at first. Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it becomes, get, it's yeah, pretty expressive. I've dabbled in other languages, but like I never actually professionally worked in something that's just like completely yeah. out there. It is different. Not that this is out there, but you know. Uh, I'd say but, M but I'd it's... say ML style languages are not all the rage until recently. Yeah. Like, you know, Reason yeah. and like Elm have become a little more mainstream since I mean, well, more mainstream than any of the MML like, other MML languages have been, usually. Right. Um cool. Alright, popularized by that uh, TV show with the ponies, right? Where they talk about the uh, ML programs. Is it MLP? That's the thing. A show called MLP about uh, ML programs. I actually have zero idea what you're talking wow, about. Wow, making it my little pony oh. joke, everyone. You can ignore it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Alright, I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I don't have friends. Okay, so I'm just kidding. I'm not a brony. But no, no offense to bronies. Gosh, but those. Probably have to cut out this part of the recording. It's not safe. Whatever. All right. So, shout out to everyone listening still. <sighs> wow. Okay. So JSON that map. So it's it's taking in stuff and it's putting out stuff. Wow. Different stuff. Yeah. Different stuff. That's what all maps but, do, right? You yeah. Know, takes right. in some stuff, gives out something else. If we didn't have JSON map here, it would just be the mouse position. Well, we talked about kind of reaching into. Um, a type and an opera and like changing the thing that, that that was in it yeah what is the thing that's in it that's changing to something else um so before it was if we just use mouse position we mm -hmm. would have a decoder of mouse position right right and um, here we were struggling to bring up the annotation and and so yeah and so now we have a decoder um that has a message our select and move annotation. Oh. And the reason it's a message is because we filled in all the all mm -hmm. the arguments to that function mm -hmm. that returns a message. The integer and the right. position. Right. Okay. So that's that's what it's doing. Right. Okay, that, that makes sense. And that would be exactly why we do care about calculating for that offset right mm -hmm. here. Otherwise I have to do it in the update. That'd be nasty. Yeah, yeah, totally. I agree. This makes a lot of sense as a place to do it. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so we were gonna look at some arrows, right? Some arrows? Yeah. Sure. Going back to our, our beautiful arrow that we wanted to um, to take a look at. I'm going to resume here. I'll just draw one more arrow to get us back in an arrow mindset. All right. So we're going to see how that was actually shown in the view layer, right? Sure. It's the, I would say right now, it's the nastiest thing I've written. <laughs> <laughs> and we probably don't need to look at all of it, but I don't really see any mouse specific code here. Well, we scroll down a lot, actually. There's view. Okay, so it will be here, because I see view line, view free draw. Again, free draw is the one where you can just, you know, just go completely crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. 
and well, right there, we were looking at it really nice. Right. Well, I wanted to look at the just the function itself. Mm -hmm. So view drawing. It's a big well, function right? still. Wow, that is big. Is this what we want to look at down here? Uh, so well, we're in this big case switch. Let's look for the arrow inside here, right? Mm. See if we can find it. Uh, it's not jumping out at me. Well, here it is. Okay, so it's one of the lines that we have. Yeah. Um, again, the difference between lines was that they don't have like four control corners, essentially. Exactly. <laughs> All right. But what is this view drawing helper? Uh, so view drawing and view drawing helper. Um, is this drawing, for actually while we're drawing? It's this is while we're drawing, not when it's right, already created. Right. But it's still a use, we're using the same yeah. views. Well, we need in to different do context. it, obviously. Yeah. So I think um, you, if we go back just to the arrow a bit, mm -hmm. can you uh, kind of give me a high level of what you think is happening yeah. just there? Right. So Greg and I learned a lot more about SVG recently, and um, let's take a look. So SVG G. What's dot G? Is that the... It's a group. Group, of course. It's the right. div of SVG. Right, the div of SVG slash the folder. Both are great names, right? <laughs> div and G. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah. Um, or those of you who actually are in an illustration tool, this is like a folder for you mm. in your um, paths. Or sorry, your layers um, view. It's like a, a group of layers. It's a, oh, it's interesting. A, and it's like looks like a folder app, kind of. I need to use some more drawing tools. So, that aren't and, and, and you can operate on all of it as a unit. You know, yes. Which is something you can do in SVG too. Yes, you can. All right. So we've got uh, a group here in our SVG. Um, no attributes is, is what this is saying. And then we have children. So our children is, um, or in, they include the result of this view arrowhead drawing, mm -hmm. um, an SVG path, um, and I'm guessing there's probably going to be a lot of magic in this function because it's so simple here. It must be complicated yeah, must somewhere, be complicated else. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then uh, view arrowhead drawing again. That's this the time part, false. Right? Mm -hmm. You want to go, 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 go command click that one? Let's keep that open. Though. Yeah. Uh, we want to oh, my invent mode? Yeah. I, I got you out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. So view arrowhead drawing bull. Well, here's the bull. It's a show drop shadow. So this is, oh. a, this is a hack. Yeah. This so is you totally just a hack. You discovered my first hack. Yeah. Uh, so when you add the drop <laughs> shadow, um, it... it it has a drop shadow over yeah. the line that's yeah. behind the... Let's demo what it's like without the hack, shall we? Um, that should be sure. really easy. Can yeah, I just sure. do that? Let's do it. All right. So, because I feel like this will just compile just fine. Where where did we go here? There was that. Okay. Um, it was this It wasn't that big drop. I think it was lower. Yeah. So, this lower. is why this thing needs to get split up. Okay. It's too big. Too big. Um, view drawing helper. Here we are. So, mm -hmm. so, the line I want to remove is just really this entire line. Uh, yeah. 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 Delete it. Okay. Not so, save. save. And then it should be. Recompiling, we'll know it's done when it refreshes. Okay, should we choose the other go today? No, because Never. it's still got that bug on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so here we go. Um, we're just gonna draw a squiggle for no reason at all, and then an arrow in purple. For some reason, I feel like arrow yeah, should be purple. Sure. And here we go. We're drawing, drawing, drawing. That's hard to tell. Maybe a lighter color, lighter color would be might good. demo it. Okay. Wow, it's so, so, there we go. In this direction, it's very strong. So it depends on the direction you're drawing it. But in this mm -hmm. direction, you can see what's going on. Now I can go real quick. Oh, wow. Now do you know why that's Yes, I thing. do, Greg, right. because the function that we edited was for when we're drawing, mm -hmm. not for when it's already done. Correct. Fascinating. So you've you've had this hack embedded in multiple parts of your code. Twice, yeah. You probably it was feel a, a little one, dirty about that. I did. It was a it was a one it was a two line change, right? Mm -hmm. But um because we just had to call a function twice, but I just wanted to ship it. So Yeah. But look <laughs> at this. Works. So it's really interesting because what's going on here is we drew two custom shapes and they had a, a shadow effect on them. Mm -hmm. Um and as you can see in the code, the the first shape is the arrowhead, and then secondly we have the path. So whenever uh, we're drawing and um, you know, the shadow is lined up so that it would it would go from the 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 middle part of the arrow onto the head, then you get this 
So pretty, pretty obvious, I think, if you haven't guessed what the hack is, you know, well, we pretty much saw it. He's drawing a second arrowhead with all the same attributes except without the shadow. So that avoids, like, the opposite bug where now the arrowhead would be dropping a shadow onto the, the mid of the body. So for any SVG filter experts out there who'd like to help in my drop shadow code, mm. I'd like to stop this hack. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter too much because we ultimately aren't giving SVG to the user right now. Right. Uh, we just give it an It's image. a PNG, but, yeah. But it's still, might as well make yeah. The, yeah. the markup really nice. And by the way, while we could easily generate an SVG to export, right? Easy? Yes. Yeah. Easily. It is an SVG <laughs> right now. Just checking. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, when you have like a pixelate feature, that's a that's that's promising your users that you're giving them a way to cover things up and obscure them. Even without a pixelate feature, the fact that mm -hmm. you could just draw, you know, a, a filled object on top of something, like a white rectangle on top of mm -hmm. someone's SSN. Yeah. That's like a way of deleting information. At least it looks like it. Yeah. But if you actually shipped a whole bunch of layers, then you're still still shipping all of that information. And if the end user is sophisticated enough, they can just go ahead and deconstruct that object you sent them, remove the layer that, that's obscuring information, and then read the data. Totally. So that is the biggest reason that we want to export PNG mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of SVG. Yeah. Um, that and it's just going to be a lot more compatible. Lot more I wonder places. if you could make a, a case for like saying, um, hey, users, like if you want an SVG, like we will just strip all of the like things that are like obvious mass, but at the same time, it's really hard because if someone makes yeah, any kind of super hard, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's just not a thing. Yeah, it's yeah, it's totally hack. Um, really interesting space to think about, though. So that was why we had this this little NC hack. Um, and as I said, you can see all the other attributes are the same. Yeah. Or at least all the values you're, you're passing to this um, arrowhead drawing. Um, not to get too into the rails here, but I guess we can't apply the uh, shadow effect to the group for some reason. Um, I believe there's, so there are certain things I've tried out in these groups and that has not worked. Like for instance, positioning all these things mm -hmm. has to be positioned. Um, like their start, their, their X's and their Y's all have to be positioned Correct. on the SVGs themselves. Yeah. G can only be used for like transforms. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can give like some other attributes. So maybe the filter will work on them, maybe. but it might manifest in, uh, like we might want something specific for the arrowhead so we don't get that back shadow. Cause one thing you didn't try was doing the drop shadow mm -hmm. um, head on the other side of it, which is actually the bug that um, I found was very subtle. Mm. And that's why I did this was because there was just a little bit of shadowing mm. happening on top of the path. Yeah, I saw that so. actually. It was, very, it was very subtle indeed. But yeah. And I so that's like, that's why this hack went out was for that subtle uh, one. And maybe, you know, I just need a different mm. uh, drop shadow filter. Yeah, who that. knows? So. Yeah. Well, it's very festive goat. I'll say that. Mm -hmm. it looks like a party. Totally. All right. So that's super, super interesting. Um, we didn't look at the constraining code, but maybe we should look at more arrow stuff first. I don't know. So do uh, you want to see that nasty, nasty function just to expose, yeah. expose me? All right. Oh, right, yeah. So it's, it's, oh, it's, I'll, cl I'll click the uh, definition. All right, this one? This no, is so that's just the, no. that was just the, the, the arrowhead drawing. I'd like to know about the arrow path. So I'm curious oh. if you can find... Oh, right here, this guy? Um, well, I think you remember writing it with me a little bit. Yeah. Really nasty. Mm -hmm. You would you would know it. So um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's look for. <laughs> oh, here we go. Right. It's the line path. Yeah. So I did the same thing for the line because um, interesting uh, fact, folks. Uh, if you uh, write that drop shadow code, the one I used from, I think I just got it from Stack Overflow. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, kudos. You're never you're never too experienced to use Stack Overflow. Um, True. And uh, I was using it on just a line. Um, SVG, well, at um, pi over two increments, it would just completely disappear, the annotation. So I rebuilt it using just a straight up SVG path, but that meant, um, you know, doing some nasty bits with uh, uh, concatenating strings. And so you can see all this work that I did here just for a simple line. Yeah. And for those of you who don't speak fluent radian, pi over two is a right angle. Yeah. And uh, given that our tool explicitly makes it easy to draw in right angles by the, the shift constraint mechanism, it's kind of a kind of a noticeable bug, though. Yeah, definitely. All right. So 
Is this this is not the function you wanted to look at? This is not the arrow one, but you get the idea from that one. Um, it's the same. It, there's right just there. some curving in it. Um, so yeah, I wonder. I don't even know if this. I don't see it. I might have put it in um, Wait, review. Are we importing it? Maybe it's in. It might be somewhere. Like, is it in utils for? I think I, I think it was such a big function. I wanted to put it in a different module, which is never a good reason to do it. No, this nope. was a tiny utils. Um. Mm -hmm. mm. So if we go back to the drawing code, right? Yeah. Where, where we had that case switch statement. Um, um, not this one? The one where we were matching on, the one where you removed the, um, the error head, like the, the call to. Yeah. So in here, mm -hmm. we see line adders, right? And that's actually a function that I defined in the let statement. Okay. And so we see that that's calling line attributes. Oops. So here we go. This is where all the magic's happening, is um, arrow attributes. And and then finally, so this is all the arrow attributes, mm -hmm. but then we have the nasty code, the D path, mm -hmm. the arrow path. Mm -hmm. So that is another in, in the interesting. And the SVG way of drawing a path. Yeah, interesting. I put it in another annotation file. Um, so this speaks out to me as I need to Find a good path. A different here. annotation file? Um, the like all the stuff around the data and mm -hmm. the abstractions like the annotation attributes type and all those things that you've seen before, like the stroke mm -hmm. color mm -hmm. and all those, that's all in this file. So I should mm -hmm. probably put this path back in the view code because mm -hmm. it's related only to the view. Right. So this is in the wrong place. Okay. Um but yeah, so this is all the arrow code. Yeah. It's it's a fun one. Yeah. Look, Greg's not a crier, but you might have cried if you were a crier during this process. <laughs> it was a, really, a lot of sweat and tears. I didn't this was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears right here. Yeah. Because um, we're not using any sort of uh, crazy abstraction that can just take a path and manipulate it. And yeah. Rotate it. Uh, I really want to make a shout out to, um, I think, Fulker T-Dev made a package where you can just, instead of doing this, you can just have a list of uh, tuples of X and Ys, and then it just represents it um, in a nice like English to read path. That would be much more readable than this. Oh, okay. So um, I plan to migrate to soon, but I want to show nice. what it's like to do it in raw. Just It can be done. <laughs> yeah. It's just nasty. <laughs> no, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the input that you had to work with was, like I actually drew a shape in SVG and gave you the SVG shape. Yeah. And I thought you'd just be able to get in there and like apply rotations and stretching to it would be great and you know i'm still not convinced that i can't do that yeah um i think that there's just some tricks you got to do with not only translate and scale mm -hmm. but translate scale and translate again mm -hmm. it's an interesting mm -hmm. i've seen it in some other svg editors so mm -hmm. maybe there's a way to delete all this but that's the best kind of mm -hmm. um hack day is when you yeah. can delete all the stuff that was hard <laughs> right right so. so what so what greg actually did is he actually went in here and he he is drawing point by point. <laughs> yeah, the with entire path. Curves. Like he, he like broke down. Like he had a whiteboard and was like doing geometry and stuff. He's like, well, you know, like look at this. He's got you know, signs <laughs> and co cosines and you know, negative theta. I mean, come on, like come on. What are we back like, in high school? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Except like you never did this in high school because this takes like too long. This is yeah. big. Like this is like a wow. So. I mean, nothing too mind blowing, right? It's like at the end of the day, you're just you're just doing a whole bunch of you know math, math, <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I right. will say, math in Elm is verbose. I don't think that's what it's targeted for. It's not mm. a platform. It's not right. Python. You know, yeah. it's not for that. So there's a lot of like I had to be very explicit about converting things to floats and using the right divider, and that's all great because like nothing weird happens. Ever. Yeah. Um, but it just means that it's a lot of code. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's that. was pretty nice. Yeah. A nice looking arrow going on. So. so do you feel, Alan, that you have a better understanding of um, kind of the process of what's going on? Is there any like big holes you think in your knowledge right now? Hmm. No, not really. Um, yeah, I think I think it'd take a little while for me to get more familiar with some of these function composition type techniques and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but it sounds like one of those things that you could probably blunder through without being too good at those for a while <laughs> you just write like extra code and then you're like oh okay, yeah. just use like some it's a lot of syntactic sugar yeah it's a lot of syntactic sugar and also the compiler helps you a lot 
Um, mm. You're not going to be really that limited. Mm. Uh, uh, Ellen even made a fix to my vertices code. I was really struggling with my um, my ellipse when and when writing the code. Right, for this. and just for background, people, uh, the the rectangle in SVG is drawn programmatically with um, two corners, like corner to corner. But for an ellipse, they decided that that didn't make sense. They had to have a start position in the center and then mm -hmm. and then um, a radius in two directions. Correct. Um, right, like a top, like a, a going up radius and a going out radius. And that was just, you know, different. So we had to translate from the bounding, the bounding coordinates that we wanted to the center out. And, um, and again, it's just, it's just math. Mm -hmm. Um, but Greg got pretty frustrated with it, and, and so I was like, Greg, where's the code? And he pointed me, like, the function that I needed to look at, um, so I got in there and fixed it up, and deleted some code, too. With a, yeah, it was very nice. My approach was, treat that as a rendering bug of SVG. Not that it's a bug, but I, I wanted to be consistent and just still think of it like it's got top left corner and a bottom right corner and so all the code around it and resizing and everything we just keep the same as if it's a rectangle mm -hmm. but when we're actually in the view like rendering out the SVG like manipulate that at that yeah. level well not even manipulate right because we're totally. not changing it we're just translating it from you know hey draw it from this coordinate to that coordinate to uh, really draw it from the center here yeah, and so uh, Alan actually removed a case. I used to have vertices rectangular, linear, and elliptical. That's right. Um, and he realized that was a redundancy. So, um, yeah, it's really great if to you, have fresh eyes on yeah, your base always. You, it's all about, in that case, it was just how you frame the problem. Exactly. And literally how you frame the ellipse. Mm -hmm. so. so, yeah, it was really fun. Um, and I think that the greatest thing was you were able to jump in on a single function. And, I mean, it's all functions all the way down, right? So it, you only had to worry about those inputs. Yeah. Um, and yeah. you were able to solve the math. So it yeah. cool. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, is there anything else uh, you wanted to address or you think? I don't know. Um, you've, you've, I, I know there's a, a big, this is a big program and we could spend a lot more time here. Um, and maybe we should, but it's getting pretty late here and we've, <laughs> we've done a lot today. So what I'd like to say at this point, um, one thing to our listeners, I hope it's been interesting and useful and if there are more things that you'd like to see in go or things that we we kind of glossed over too fast or whatever please let us know you know assuming this is on youtube or whatever leave a comment below mm -hmm. if you're watching elsewhere you know you Message me find us you know we're yeah, on the internet you know we're on uh, the slack channel now so yeah i think just... we both have like our names.com right i'm yeah. alanhogan.com you're greg Zegan.com. Yeah, it's pretty easy to find. And it's Z I E. Z I E G A N. And um, Hogan, like, uh, like Hulk Hogan. Hogan yeah. nice. <laughs> and uh, Alan, A L A N. It's nice. important. Anyway, um, so reach out to us and, and maybe we'll do a follow up. I think that'd be really fun. Um, and the other thing I just want to say before we get going is uh, I want to thank my co host here, Greg, so much for taking the time to. Walk me through his code here and and patiently uh, listen to my um, semi-correct explanations of what's going on and it's been really really fantastic and I feel like I've learned a lot about um, about how to how to write a bigger more complicated app in L. Semi-correct definitions, by the way, are all the process of learning. So I think that it's extremely valuable to hear him because I bet you a lot of people's definitions are like as half correct as yours were. Right. I hope I hope. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise you're just hopefully my ideas aren't like too weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so again thank you to to you Greg and to our listeners for sticking it out and everything and and have a have a great rest of your day. Absolutely. <laughs>